Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Sunday of the month, which means it's time for Dr. Peter Rogers and his Nutrition Insights. And today, he is going to pose the question, is iron the most toxic metal? Please welcome to the show, Dr. Peter Rogers. It's so great to see you again in your fabulous artwork. Thank you. Um, yeah, so today is iron the most toxic metal. And I'm gonna start out with a story from years ago when I was in private practice. I'm talking to one of my guys, buddies. We're walking down the hallway and then this really beautiful nurse who I kind of was interested in turned the corner in front of us. She's walking ahead of us. I'd been thinking of asking her out. She's real nice. And she got that hourglass figure to men love. And I said to my friend, I would gladly give half my salary to have her in my bed. And he looks at me and he says, you know, she would, she would want a lot more than that. And I thought, what an advantage she has over me. I have to give up at least half my salary to even get a chance to date her. I said, you know, we like women more than they like us, the men. Why did God design the world this way? And later I learned that women have other advantages too. They're healthier than men. They live longer. Okay, here's one paper here. Um, and this author, Jerome Sullivan, this was a landmark paper in 1981. He put forth the idea that women live longer than men because they're protected by menstruation because it lowers their iron level. Okay, and then you can measure iron levels in the blood. Uh, the best way to do it is measure something called the ferritin level in the blood. And the higher the ferritin level, the sooner the person dies. It's almost like predicting your future mortality. In this study right here, it's the same as this paper, the persons who had a ferritin level over 600, they 50% of them died, median survival at 55 years of age. If their ferritin level was less than 200, they lived an average of 79 years of age, which is pretty good. And actually normal ferritin is less than 100. Probably the best experts recommend keeping it below 80. So there's a lot of room for improvement. This is sort of low hanging fruit for anybody. Okay, now another thing that comes up is why is life expectancy in the United States declining? Okay, it's been going down more and more. It used to be 79 and it keeps dropping. Also, women live longer than men. Nowadays, they're saying about six years longer. It used to be about seven years longer. The other question I would put forth, if modern medicine is so good and the science is so good, why are people fatter and sicker than ever before? And why are they dying sooner? So not enough people are low-fat vegan. So anyways, anti-aging secret, menstruation jealousy. So the healthiest people are premenopausal women. Why are they healthier? Why are they living longer? Well, menstruation lowers the hematocrit. When you lower the hematocrit, the blood is less thick, less thick blood, lower blood viscosity. It can be pumped at a lower pressure. So their blood pressures are lower. In addition, they'll have more young W red blood cells, RBCs coming out of the bone marrow. They're more deformable. They can bend more easily as they pass through capillaries. It's partly because they're less glycated. It's all, that means sugar's bound to them. So they're less stiff. Also, there's less externalization of phospholipid to the outer leaf of the plasma membrane. What that means is the uh, phospholipid composition of the plasma membrane of the red blood cell, it changes over the life of the RBC. RBCs live about 120 days and they become more stiff as this, this, phosph this phospholipid moves to the outer membrane. So anyways, younger RBCs are more flexible. Also, their iron levels in their body, as indicated by ferritin, are lower. So for those three reasons, women are healthier, and they almost never have a premenopausal myocardial infarction. Okay, um, when I look at brain MRIs and I look at spine MRIs and, and CT scans, women's brains and spines look younger than men's. In general, you show me a 60-year-old guy, he's probably going to have a couple silent strokes. An American who's eating the sad standard American diet, he's probably going to have a couple small silent strokes. We call them periventricular flare hyperintensities on his brain MRI. A woman's will usually be clean and normal. Okay, I can kind of tell a person's age just from looking at their a uh, couple images from their brain MRI or CT or um, uh, the same thing with their spine. So anyways, okay, menstruation usually stops around 50, but they become postmenopausal. And then the risk of heart attack, cancer, stroke, the common causes of death, diabetes all start going up and they start aging more rapidly. So what I'm saying is, if menstruation is keeping a woman healthy, why stop at menopause? You could get, you know, periodic every couple of months, get a phlebotomy. You could also lower your iron levels by certain things you do with your diet, of course. But I think this idea of a small volume therapeutic phlebotomy is a good idea. I know some of the greatest uh, atherosclerosis researchers in the world, and they, they donate blood every four months. Um, 
I would also like to announce my retirement from conventional medicine. I'm going to open up an anti-aging clinic and do mostly blood draws. I'm just joking with that, but there is a logic to it. All right, uh, here's some papers, a big paper coming out of the Mayo Clinic. They did over 2,000 hysterectomies. And what they found was if a woman had a hysterectomy before 35 years of age, she had 2.5 times more coronary artery disease and 4.6 times more congestive heart failure because they lose the protection of the monthly menstruation. And China did a big study on that and they got similar results. So like I said, higher hematocrit, blood's thicker, higher viscosity, blood pressure goes up. RBCs are stiffer, same thing, blood pressure goes up. Higher body storage of iron, you're gonna have a weaker immune system, you're gonna have more oxidative stress. And people aren't aware of these things. Also, I think when a woman has a hysterectomy, they're not as aware as a guy is about atherosclerosis risk factors because they don't see their friends having problems. If you're a guy 40 years of age, you've heard about somebody you know becoming impotent or having a myocardial infarction and stuff like that. Okay, another thing people don't think about much, some women are on uh, oral contraceptive pills for many, many years, and that's going to decrease the volume of their menstruation. That also is associated with increased risk of arterial blood clots, venous blood clots. So that's something to be aware of. Um, if you're going to be on those uh, pills for decades. Um, they've also got uh, dialysis patients. And when they put them on the epoetin to make their red blood cells increase production, increase their hematocrit, they'll die sooner. So one has to be very careful with kidney failure patients about how, how high you try to push up their hemoglobin. It can be uh, not have the results one would hope for. Okay, and again, one of my basic principles is, you know, you kind of want to try to live like Adam and Eve, but with indoor heating and plumbing. Keep life simple and natural to the extent that you can. And I kind of joke about this, that if the what love is to a relationship, whole food plant-based diet is to health. Above all, love each other deeply. This is uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. For love, like whole food plant-based diet, covers a multitude of sins. Use whatever gift you've received to help others. And the point I'm saying is, if you just get this diet right, it fixes about 30 different things. So that's why I'm such a big believer in it. Believe me, there's no money in this. I do this because it's such a great thing and it's such an opportunity for health. Uh, also, I've been kind of amazed at what happens to doctors. They go through med school, they read the standard conventional textbooks, which really only prepare them for pharmacology. Um, and so they don't learn anything about nutrition virtually or toxicology. And I'm kind of kidding around here, but I went and met specialists in different fields, and I was shocked at how few of them have read the papers in their own fields. So I've decided to make it easier for them. I'm working on a hooked on phonics version for doctors of the main papers in some of the different specialty fields. For endocrinology, I'm going to have Sweeney, Hemsworth, Brownlee, Taylor, Shulman papers. I'll put them in the nursery rhymes, like what causes insulin resistance. It's not that hard. Avoid the lard. Obviously, there's more to it than that, but that's the most important thing. For cardiologists, I'm, I'm currently finishing up a classic comics version of Dr. Elselson's book on how to prevent and reverse heart disease. For the nephrologists, we're making a Dr. Kempner film, somewhat like a James Bond movie, you know, as he had an extraordinary career in social life. Uh, for the rheumatologists, we'll teach him about leaky gut and so on. Okay, now here's another thing, the Mediterranean diet. I actually recently went to an obesity course, a conventional medicine obesity course, and Everyone was promoting there the Mediterranean diet and even a ketogenic version of the Mediterranean diet, which I thought was ridiculous. Plus, I've noticed most of the major universities that I've seen, including the Ivy League ones that I've seen, are promoting the Mediterranean diet. And I think it's a terrible diet. It doesn't forbid, you know, it encourages olive oil, canola oil, all these oils, liquid fat. It encourages chicken, fish, beef, and dairy and cheese, alcohol, sweets, nuts. And, you know, how are you going to get a person healthy with all that fat, all that animal protein, et cetera? Um, and I think what happens is the patients will go to these big name places. And then when the Mediterranean diet fails, then they feel they've exhausted their options and they submit to being on pills for the rest of their life or having surgery. And in a sense, the system milks them for money. And so that's why I wrote Chump here on the cow, because I think a lot of people have uh, you know, missed out on an opportunity because they're simply not aware of the low fat, whole food, plant-based diet. Um, and you know, they end up fat, sick, and broke until they die. Messy will do the pill and send a bill. Okay, so what causes insulin resistance? There was um, a viewer recently who had asked about that. And I've, I've given several different lectures about diabetes before, but just a quick summary of some of the main things for, for this person to ask. I think it's relevant to a lot of people. The main thing is the concept of overnutrition, excessive dietary saturated fat in particular, but excessive dietary omega-6 fats, like from fried foods, cooking things with oils. That's a dramatic commit. Uh, uh, contribute to that, you know, like the Tetsumori Yamashima research. 
And then we don't have time to get into mechanisms today because this talks about, you know, iron issues. But just so you know, excessive dietary sodium, iron, animal protein, fructose, alcohol, these all contribute to insulin resistance. Dairy, especially the type 1 diabetes. F minus water, it's a mitochondrial toxin. And there's a lot of other mitochondrial toxins. They will all increase the risk of developing insulin resistance. Psychological stress, elevating cortisol, stress equivalents, caffeine, sleep deprivation, corticosteroid medications. The obesogenic chemicals like the estrogenics, okay, atrazine and many others. Obesity promotes insulin resistance. You know, you're going to be leaking fat into the blood. And then the lack of the plant foods, the dietary potassium and magnesium vasodilators. You need vasodilation to have optimal insulin sensitivity. Um, that's part of the mechanism through which insulin works. Uh, lack of exercise. Exercise will get the GLUT4 transporters going up to the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cells, and that'll increase insulin sensitivity. And then there's something about circa inhibitors. Again, we don't have time to go into this, but just be aware of it. I think that that is relevant and probably helpful. These are some of the famous uh, researchers that have written papers on diabetes that might be helpful if somebody's interested in studying that more. I just included one paper on circa inhibitors. That means sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase, and beta cells, but it's in other cells too. So that's all I'm going to say today about uh, insulin resistance. Well, actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship of iron to it, but I just did that for one viewer who, who was sort of desperately eager to get some information on that. Okay, here's a bunch of mitochondrial toxins. You know, HG, uh, GP from the non-organic foods, cadmium, atrazine from the corn. It's common, uh, commonly used on the corn, non-organic, uh, lead, F-, minus, excessive iron, excessive copper. All of these things are toxic to mitochondria and hydroxynodinol from the omega-6 uh, cooking oils. So what I'm sort of saying here is no matter what you do, you're going to be exposed to some of this stuff. And that's why it's a good idea to optimize everything else to the extent you can so that you'll have more reserve to handle all this stuff. Our bodies are good at handling problems, but you just don't want to overwhelm the body. Okay, now it's springtime. And so rather joyous, it's May. Um, go outdoors and get your sunshine. That's the best source of vitamin D. This is a lovely painting here, Apple Trees in Bloom by Nikolai Ostrup. A great song. The song of the season is uh, Vivaldi's Spring. Okay, and uh, spring is a time of renewal and coming back to life for all the plants and hopefully our health. Okay, here is a beautiful painting called El Emparado, which is just sort of like the bow, like shelter above. Uh, more musical suggestions for spring as we enjoy the May flowers. Okay, um, now kind of back to that concept like about the mitochondrial toxins. There's a lot of unhealthy stuff um, in the food, in the air, and a lot of times in the water if it's not filtered. So again, by optimizing what we can, we'll optimize our health. Here's a quote by John Locke. The only fence against the world is a thorough knowledge of it. So by knowing about these things, we can avoid them, the ones that are bad for our health. And one that is not widely known, and that's why I'm talking about it today, is iron. For example, you know, I think it was back in 1979 in particular, they upped all the fortification of a lot of cereals and grains um, with iron, and you don't want that. Uh, unless you're really iron deficient, and very few people are, um, this type of iron, it's it's really adds up in most men and women postmenopausal become significantly iron overloaded. I would recommend avoiding that. But just so you know, iron is a big thing. And part of where this comes from is like when I was young, Popeye the, cart the Sailor Man was one of the most popular cartoons. And you had this idea that he's so strong, he squeezes the can of spinach. And then he gulps down the, the uh, spinach because it's got lots of iron. They used to think I, spinach had 10 times as much iron as it does because they miscalculated the decimal point. And you kind of had this idea. Like when I was a kid, I always wanted to eat the cereal with the most iron. Like Raisin Bran had like 25% of your recommended daily for each serving. And I used to always eat the entire box real fast. And I thought that was a great thing. And it kind of gave this idea, you know, you'll be strong. You'll get the woman. If Bluto comes along, you can fight them off. And there was this whole macho thing attached to getting more iron. Okay, now here's one of the great secrets of iron. Iron is needed by bacteria to grow. And that's highly relevant to a lot of people, not only for your immune system, but also because cancer is very much like a bacteria. Cancer needs iron to grow. If you look at an egg, the eggshell is permeable to bacteria, but somehow they almost never get to the yolk. That's where the embryo is. And the reason is the egg white protein is deficient in iron. It has next to zero iron. So the bacteria cannot work its way to the egg yolk because it can't get through the deficiency of iron in the egg white. They even used to put egg white into wounds to help prevent infection. All right, so what I'm showing you is it's like a person, if you had to walk through the desert, you, know, you can't walk a long distance in the desert because you got no water. And that's what our body does. We withhold iron 
to prevent activation of bacteria because a lot more bacteria get in our blood than people realize. Okay, here was a painting like uh, we talked about. This is a picture from the movie Seven Seal by Igmar Bergman of the knight playing chess with death. And I thought this was a little interesting. I showed a picture of this once before. My kid saw it and he got this idea to make a, a painting of it. I thought this was pretty cool. So there's the hourglass of how much time we've got left. There's the Grim Reaper. And there's each one of us, you know, working our moves to try to keep death as far away as possible. Okay, here's another thing about the serum ferritin is very much like this hourglass. The higher your serum ferritin, that predicts the sooner you die. All right, so you want to keep it below 80 optimally. And mine was high. I checked it a couple of years ago, and it was like two years ago or something. It was like 240. I'm like, crap, how did it get high? Because I was eating all that raisin bran when I was young. I didn't know any better. So then I donated a little blood, and I also avoided stuff more meticulously, and it's gone down a lot. I actually had it was supposed to have it for today, but I, didn't, I couldn't get the lab results. Anyways, I want to just show you because I'm going to start talking about some pretty fancy stuff and some really interesting, sophisticated uh, biochemistry, molecular biology, and people are going to be looking at me, including all the doctors. Where did you get all this information? How come we never heard this before? And I'm going to tell you, there is tons of paperwork on this. This guy, Gregory Sloops, the best atherosclerosis research in the world, and he's been writing about blood viscosity for decades. When you start writing about blood viscosity, you start talking about blood donation, all right? And that's how this connects to iron. This guy, Randall Laufer here, back in the 1990s, wrote a great book called Iron in Your Heart. I couldn't get a cover of it, but here's another book he wrote about iron. And it showed, the, like that paper from Jerome Solomon in 1981, tremendous correlations between excessive iron overload and coronary artery disease. So um, that was a big book. Uh, Exposing the Hidden Dangers of Iron, this guy, Eugene Weinberg, he's another researcher. He was especially interested in how the body sequesters iron to keep it away from cancer and from infections. This is a handbook of iron overload. Uh, this guy, Britton, wrote some really good papers. Some of these other guys as well. Um, I, this is a guy who wrote a book about getting your iron down to age better. And this guy, he's 65. He looks great. Uh, Leo Zacharski, I'll show you a picture of him later. He did a lot of the great research on figuring out ferritin levels. Um, iron, the most toxic metal, this PhD is a good summary of the research. This guy, Vernon Louvre, he's an excellent teacher of hematology. You want to learn hematology, he's great. Really clear, nice, great metaphors and examples. And then this guy, these two are like geniuses. Um, so she and name is Etheresia Pretorius. He's Douglas Kell. And they figured out some really advanced stuff about iron that I'm going to show you today. Uh, so like I said, I've never met a single doctor that is familiar with these advanced issues about iron chemistry. I talked to an infectious disease doctor, three infectious disease doctors from a, from a university. And uh, none of them knew about the stuff I'm going to tell you about today. And so... Believe me, it's good stuff, and it's it's actually widely known. There's tons of papers on this stuff, but it's just not known in the medical community. It's known amongst PhDs specializing in this, like in their own silo. Okay, so here is iron. It's one of the transitional metals in the so-called D block for the orbital configuration. And the unique thing about these transitional metals like iron is that it can have a variable valence, a variable charge. Most typically in the human body, it's only going to be Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus. But that fact, it can be different charges. It's always handing off electrons. Lots of enzymes, they want iron right in the center to hand off electrons in the active site to run a lot of reactions. Okay, so iron does a lot of stuff in the human body. Okay, here's iron. It's right in the center of hemoglobin. It's going to bind to oxygen. Whenever you eat meat, you're going to be eating heme. Soy has a little bit of heme as well, but when you ever you eat meat, you're going to be eating heme. And the iron in heme is very highly absorbed, much, much higher than is iron from plants. Whenever you eat a plant, right in the center of chlorophyll is magnesium, and that's good stuff, vasodilator, okay? Here's a more detailed drawing of the heme in um, hemoglobin, and you can see the iron right here in the center. It's bound to oxygen, and then down here, it's also bound to a histidine residue, plus it coordinates the bonds to several nitrogens. So iron has relatively fancy chemistry, but this unique ability to be changing its valence and handing off electrons makes it you know, essential for the human body. About 70% of iron in the body is going to be bound up in hemoglobin. Now, here's what happens to people. Men start accumulating iron right when they're about 20 years of age. Their levels start going way up in westernized countries where they eat high iron diets and the food is uh, fortified, enriched with iron, a lot of the cereals and other grains. With women, they keep their iron levels pretty low. And we're looking right here, total body stored iron. We could put ferritin on here. And um, after menopause, their iron starts going up really high. 
this gets you into trouble because you're going to overwhelm the body storage capacity. Once you overwhelm the body storage capacity, you really want it down here at the lower part. Once you overwhelm the body storage capacity, you start leaking free iron and free iron is dangerous. We'll talk about that in a moment. Oh, here's another question. Why do we have such high iron? If you check out this YouTube video, it's really cool. There's going to be a song. It's called Maasai Man. Maasai Man. And they have to fight a lion. And you, man, when you fight a lion, there's a high risk of some bleeding. And that's why we've got the ability to store so much iron. So in case we bleed, we can really quickly replenish our hemoglobin so that we don't uh, have severe anemia and die. You know, a male lion right, weighs about 500 pounds, twice as big as a 250-pound guy, which is pretty big. Okay, it's a great song. You'll love that. You'll love that song if you check it out. All right, why is iron overload so dangerous? Well, here's the normal electron transport chain within a mitochondria. Here's the outer mitochondria membrane. Here's the inner mitochondria membrane. And this is like firemen in a bucket brigade handing off electrons, and they pass down a gradient to more and more electronegativity, meaning desire to grab that electron. And the energy of, of it's like a snowball rolling down a hill. And the energy it generates is used to pump protons into the space between the outer and the inner mitochondrial membrane. And then that proton gradient of hydrogen protons is used to uh, drive this ATP synthase to make ATP. And that's how most energy in the human body is produced. Some electrons leak off the transport chain, the fireman bucket brigade. And usually the body can handle them pretty well with an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. But when you eat a lot of dietary fat or you have some of those mitochondrial toxins involved, you're going to start leaking more electrons here and you can overwhelm this uh, cleanup system. And if you simultaneously have free iron within the mitochondria, you'll run something called the Fenton reaction. It's easy to remember Fe for iron. That means from ferrous. That's the Latin for iron. Um, it's really ferrous, the color red, like rust. And anyways, the Fenton reaction will run and that produces hydroxyl radicals, much, much more damaging than these superoxide or these hydrogen peroxides. And these hydroxyl radicals can damage in a real significant way the inner mitochondrial membrane. So anyways, uh, you wanna know that you don't want excess free iron. It causes lots of problems. It can destroy mitochondrial membranes. That's that's worth knowing. And it, it synergizes into this process of lipid peroxidation. There's even a combined process of iron overload with lipid peroxidation where it's causing cells to die. And that's gonna be called ferroptosis. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Okay, here's another graph of serum ferritin, which is an indicator of your total body iron storage. So remember that total body iron storage is, and the higher they get abnormal, the more you're going to see these breakdown products in the urine. So this is 8-hydroxy uh, deoxyguanosine, all right? And the more of that in your urine, the more tissue is being damaged through oxidative stress. Um, and so the sicker the person is likely to be, and the sooner they tend to die. Um, here's this guy again, Douglas Kell, one of his papers. He wrote a great paper called Iron Behaving Badly. He's a, he's a real brilliant guy, fascinating scientist. And his partner, Pretorius, she's super bright too. Um, like we were, like I was saying, the real dangerous radicals are the ones coming off of the hydroxyls. Okay, uh, you can get a feedback loop going in a negative way. The iron absorption is regulated by hepcidin. I'll show you pictures of it in a moment, but hypoxia can cause lowering of hepcidin can lead to more iron absorption. You can get a circle where you get this negative feedback loop making things worse and worse. Okay, I'll show you just briefly uh, some stuff from the hematology of red blood cells. We'll go into more of this later, but just to introduce you to it. Here's a normal red blood cell. It's discoid in shape, about seven microns diameter. Here it is next to a normal strand of thrombin and fibrin. Um, and normally the, the clot is gonna look like spaghetti relatively straight threads of fibrin and thrombin mixed in there. But when you start having high amounts of iron, you'll have a tendency to distort the shape of more and more red blood cells, presumably because of oxidative stress in the cell's membranes. Also, you're going to distort the shape of the clot. The clot becomes more disorganized, messy. They'll call these dense matted deposits. And this is going to be something called uh, amyloid configuration of a clot. I'll explain what that means in just a little bit. And that's a key point though. The presumed oxidative stress from the iron is distorting the shape and bacteria will release endotoxins that do this too. These clots are worse clots. They're harder to open up by the body. That's, they're harder to lyse. They're more likely to occlude an artery um, and cause a complication, you know, heart attack or stroke, for example. Okay. So we'll go over how that works. LPS right here comes from the gram-negative bacteria, LTA from the gram-positive bacteria. All right, now here's what redox cycling is. 
this is a word you want to know, ferrous redox cycling. So again, ferrous means iron, redox means you're handing off and accepting electrons, you know, reduction in oxidation. So the Fe2 plus goes to Fe3 plus and back and forth. And while this is happening, the iron molecules are sort of spinning around. They're dropping off electrons to the oxygen. Actually, I, I wanted this going the other way to, to create O2 minus. But the net result of all this is they're going to produce these hydroxyl radicals. And these will damage DNA. They'll damage plasma membranes. They'll damage anything they contact with. It's like bouncing a Super Bowl, you know, in a glass shop or something. It's just going to break whatever it bounces into. So you really want to avoid this to the extent you can. But this, this is why you never want iron free by itself, because that guy who wrote one of those books, Eugene Weinberg, he had described it as, he said, iron is like fire. You want it to help you in your fireplace, in your stove, but you do not want it in your heater, but you do not want it uh, floating free, you know, burn things up and destroy things. And that's pretty much iron is like in the human body. Okay, so the body normally always has it bound to something to prevent it from doing damage like what we just saw. And then you can just check in the blood or the urine these markers of when there's excessive free iron causing oxidative stress. The hydroxyl radical reacts so fast you can't see it. All you can see is the damage products, the devastation it wreaks um, by measuring these, these things. You can tell you're destroying lipids if you got hydroxynonanol and malone dialdehyde. You can tell DNA if you got eight uh, hydroxy two deoxyguanosines, et cetera. So that's how it works. Okay, so here was a painting. This is Burning City uh, by Egbert van der Poel, showing that this is what iron's like when it gets in the wrong place. It, it contributes to a lot of diseases, excessive amounts of free iron causing oxidative stress, as well as reactivating dormant bacteria. Okay, so what's oxidative stress? Oxidative stress just means these uh, pathological oxidation reactions that occur when you've got too much oxidants around, excessive amounts of iron, excessive amounts of copper, excessive amounts of omega-6 fats. Um, these can synergize with the iron to produce lipid peroxidation and kill cells. That's called ferroptosis. Um, hypoxia will also cause oxidative stress in a cell. Um, leaky gut will contribute to this as well by causing inflammation and increasing LPS getting into the blood. LPS is lipopolysaccharide from the gram-negative bacteria. The good stuff comes from plants. You know, what do you expect? That's how it always is. Um, you, you get your vitamins, you get your other nutrients, helps you to have good blood flow, all these antioxidants. A plant makes antioxidants because imagine you're in a hot field, it's 100 degrees. What a person would do is go, gee, it's hot. You're going to walk into the shade, all right? But a plant can't do that. It has to sit out in the sun. So the way the, sun, the plants protect themselves is they make lots of antioxidants to protect themselves from the excess sun, excessive sun, for example. When we eat the plant, we get them. When you eat an animal, you don't get them because the animal's already used up most of their antioxidants. Okay, here's ferroptosis. That's the mechanism. Fer meaning uh, iron, ptosis to fall off. So fried food is like a recipe for ferroptosis. You got the omega-6 fats, which uh, tend into causing lipid peroxidation problems. And you got the excessive iron. And together, they synergize to make the whole process worse and cause ferroptosis, leading to cell death. So you don't want that. That's why like, it's, it's a really bad thing to be eating fried meat, for example. The terrible uh, thing to be eating because you got all the omega-6 fats and all the iron, Let's say fried beef, for example. All right, here's a picture. We know we eat the dietary iron. We typically eat one or two milligrams a day. Actually, a man should be only absorbing. He'll eat more than one milligram, but he'll only absorb, typically, if he's healthy, about one milligram a day. A woman will absorb about two milligrams a day because she's premenopausal and she's menstruating. She has double the iron loss that a man does. A lot of it's stored in muscle myoglobin um, locally. Uh, most of it's stored in the red blood cells um, so in the red, and some in the bone marrow, of course, to make the red blood cells. The transferrin, you know, trans for transport, ferrin is iron, to transport iron around the blood. That only has three milligrams, but that's what shuttles it all over the place. I'll show you a better picture of that in just a moment. The liver is the storage center for iron in the body. It has tons of ferritin molecules, and I'll show you a picture of them in a moment where they store lots of iron. But that's why somebody who has liver disease, fatty liver, alcoholic liver damage, hepatitis liver damage, they're at high risk to be leaking iron into the blood and having that cause problems. The macrophages are especially in the spleen where they recycle the red blood cells. Spleen is like the, is like the graveyard for red blood cells. Uh, this is a paper this comes from, really nice uh, illustrations here. This is absorption across the gut wall, also from the same paper by Andrews from 1999. Um, that the iron is absorbed. This is a, you know, a, a divalent uh, metal transporter, okay? It'll absorb the iron into the cells. This is a 
lining cells of the gut. The gut's called the enteric tract, so these are called enterocytes. And then it can store iron here for a couple of days, but if we need the iron, it'll be released into the blood and then it'll get picked up by the transferring carriers. This, this little blue thing here that lets the iron go from the enterocyte to the blood is called ferroportin. Ferro means iron, portin means door. So ferroportin is the iron door. That's gonna be real important. Ferroportin is the iron door. Okay, here's a pretty fancy diagram. There's a lot of different ways to draw these diagrams. I think this is the best one. This guy, Vernon Liu, uh, he's a great teacher, hematologist, expert on iron. And he he's sort of teaches in a similar fashion. I think he's great if you want to learn a lot about iron and blood. Okay, so here's your gut. The blue things are the iron, pieces of iron. They get absorbed into the enterocyte. And then whether or not they get into the blood depends on ferroportin. If you've got hepcidin, hep, because it's made in the liver for hepatic, cidin means to kill. It means to kill bacteria. This blocks the ferroportin because by blocking iron absorption, we starve the bacteria in our body of iron. So that's why it's called hepcidin. I also call it fer, you know, fer, uh, ferrous lowering, okay, just to remember it. The transferrin is the transport protein for iron. And it looks like a little kayak, okay, a kayak or a boat, a rowboat. Um, Randall Offer likes to call it a wheelbarrow. The bottom line is it carries two. Uh, you want to know that, two, two little molecules of iron. So it'll pick them up here from the ferroportin from the gut, and it'll transport them around. It'll drop them off at the bone marrow, which Vernon Louvre describes as a factory to make red blood cells. That's where you make all your red blood cells, your other blood cells. Um, it'll then go to the liver to be stored or to other locations wherever it's needed. Um, when there's 120 days have elapsed, it goes to the spleen, and that's where it dies. And that's because a uh, red blood cell is about seven microns. You want to know that. It's seven microns in diameter. And typically it'll go through a capillary about five microns, but in the spleen, the sinusoids are even smaller, let's say three microns. So this red blood cell has to be really flexible or it just can't go through there. It'll, it'll break apart, it'll lice. And these macrophages suck up all the iron. I drew one like, look like a Pac-Man sucking up the iron. And that's a reservoir to store iron. Um, ferritin molecules like this big bucky ball, or it's been described like a Buckminster Fuller geodesic dome. It can hold 4,500 molecules of iron. So that's a lot. Remember, transferrin only holds two, just two, but this holds, 4,500, that's a lot. And um, they're mostly stored in the liver, okay? It's stored all over the body, but especially in the liver. And what you don't want, when the body has excessive iron, it starts getting this stuff, NTBI. That means non-transferrin bound iron. And this is what causes all the trouble. This is what causes all that oxidative stress, okay? And that's basically iron metabolism, how it works. Um, this is just showing hepcidin was that molecule released by the liver when you want to decrease your iron's iron coming into the body. It'll bind to the ferroportin and then it'll be taken into the cell and they'll both be, you know, um, dissolved by a lysosome. So here's hepcidin. Again, hep for hepatic from the liver. Cidin, because it kills bacteria. It kills bacteria by preventing them from getting iron. That makes bacteria die. Okay, or at least go into dormancy, into hibernation, so to speak. And like I said, I'll call it Fe lowering to remember what it does. Hc for hepcidin, Fl for uh, ferritin, uh, ferrous lowering, FE iron lowering. Um, things that'll increase hepcidin production will be if there's an infection or an inflammation because the body is worried about the infection being by bacteria and it wants to hide the iron from them. Okay. And there's tissue damage can lead to some of this as well, but PAMPs, we're not going to get in PAMPs and DAMPs. I talked about that stuff with my autoimmune lecture, but just know that when you've got an infection, the body does everything it can to hide the iron and that way prevent the bacteria from growing. Um, hypoxia will increase no hypoxia will decrease hepcidin because it wants to absorb more iron and that can be a problem that can lead to negative feedback cycles okay uh what's interesting on here just a little more detail about dallas kind of shows the hepcidin internalizing again okay so what are some good things to know about iron ferrum comes from the latin word for iron and it really is like the color of rust sort of reddish brown um, usually your charge is going to be two plus or three plus on the iron molecules in the body. I remember ferrous, ferrous with the two being like oos and deuce, deuce is two in Spanish. So that's how I remember that one. That's sometimes called the bad iron, if you will. Um, ferique has the eek in there. And I remember the eek from the eye. And, um, I remember that has a three charge on it. That's not that important unless you're really interested in this stuff, but you're going to hear those terms all the time. So it's kind of nice to know what they mean. Um, heme iron is like from the meat, like we spoke about. Ferriportin was the door of absorption on the enterocytes. 
We talked about hepcidin. Fibrinogen is the major clotting protein in the blood. It's also an acute, acute phase reactant, meaning that when there's inflammation, infection in the body, the liver releases more of that into the blood. And that's a major, major, major clotting protein. And iron is going to distort that. And that's why it becomes a big deal for our purposes. Transferrin is a transporter of iron in the blood. Okay. So here's more detail about transferrin, the iron transport in the blood. Normally, its job of transferrin is to bind all the iron in the blood, doesn't want anything free sitting around to the extent that's possible. And now another way this becomes relevant in diabetes, you start glycating things, meaning binding sugars to different molecules. And the problem is you'll bind sugar to the transferrin and it'll start to leak iron into the blood, causing more uh, free iron, non-transferrin bound iron. Also, you'd be leaking iron from your... Uh, from your ferritin molecules that are intracellular and you can leak it from other ones. So what I'm trying to say is this is one of the reasons why diabetic patients sort of often progressively crash and burn and become cognitively impaired and stuff. And I see so many diabetics when I talk to them, they just go, Oh, I'm doing okay. Uh, you know, it's under control. It's under control. And it's like, you don't realize how sick you are. Smart move for a diabetic is really, really, really get their uh, diet and lifestyle together so they can minimize all these problems. They'll live a lot longer and healthier and they'll keep their cognitive function longer. Um, let's see, what is most interesting to us? Normal trans transferrin saturation is going to be somewhere in the ballpark of 20 to 40. Some people make that range a little more narrow, 25 to 35%, or even 30 to 35%. But just so you know, that's sort of the ballpark. All right. For our purposes, we'll just call it 20 to 40%, a little wider, looser range, but that's good enough for our purposes. Here's the big one to know. We'll come back to this many times in this talk. Serum ferritin, if you're going to donate blood or you want to know where you're at, in a perfect world, you'd like to be a little bit below 80. And don't get me wrong, mine is above that because I didn't know when I recently learned about this thing some years ago, and I'm gradually working mine down to that. There's a synergistic effect to atherosclerosis if you have high cholesterol with the high ferritin. A lot of people think that ferritin is a more accurate predictor of atherosclerotic risk factor than is the cholesterol. But the smart move is get them both down. But if you at least you get your cholesterol down, you're probably in pretty good shape. Okay, like we talked about, inflammation, infection, those things, or iron overload, they're going to cause you to uh, release more hepcidin and shut down absorption. Um, if you need more red blood cells, you're going to decrease hepcidin. Okay, so what hepcidin does, it's going to bind ferroportin, especially on the gut over here, and prevent it from, where's the gut? Oh, I don't even got the, here's the gut. It's going to block it right here to slow down absorption if hepcidin levels are increased. So normally, we only absorb about one or two milligrams per day. We normally only excrete about one or two milligrams per day. We especially excrete them, excrete them from our gut. These cells will take up iron and they don't necessarily release it into the blood like we talked about. That can be blocked by hepcidin, shutting the ferroportin door. And then after about three days, they'll slough off. They'll just desquamate, come off and we'll, we'll get rid of them in our, in our feces. Um, and they'll come out here in our feces, so to speak. So most iron metabolism is based on recycling iron from when the red blood cells are lysed after 120 days of life, okay? And that's how our body handles it. But the key point is we're not made to eat meat because our ancestors had a hard time getting enough iron. So we don't even have a way to excrete it. We don't have any good way to excrete it. You lose a little bit in your sweat. You lose a little bit when your skin sloughs off, but that's not much. And then you lose a little bit from your gut like we spoke about, you know, one or two milligrams a day. Usually one milligram a day for a man. For a woman, two milligrams a day if she's menstruating. So that is not much. That's why it's so easy to become iron overloaded because we don't get rid of it well. We have no way to ramp up our excretion. Okay, um, another little thing, a little tricky is vitamin C will actually increase iron absorption. So if somebody is especially worried about the details here, that could become relevant. Or if somebody's iron deficient with iron deficiency anemia, they might even want the vitamin C simultaneously when they have high iron to increase absorption. But for most of us, is kind of a non-issue. You just eat a plant-based diet, but just be aware of that because that does come up sometimes. And we'll always remember heme iron is much more highly absorbed. That's why, in my opinion, you don't ever want to eat heme iron. Here's an example of what happens when you enrich a food. And in my opinion, you don't ever want to eat this enriched stuff unless you have a significant iron deficiency. So here is a steel cut oats, and this is not iron enriched. You've only got one milligram per serving, okay, for this 170 calories. And so that's a relatively low amount of iron intake and it's plant-based iron. So it's not going to be absorbed that much. That's very reasonable. Now let's take a look at this raisin bran cereal over here, 4.5 milligrams per serving. So it's about, about almost 4.5 times more iron per serving than this. 
Okay, so you can get iron overloaded pretty fast if you're eating that sort of thing. 25% of like, I guess the RDA per serving. That's a lot of iron. When I was a kid, again, I ate that because I didn't know any better. Um, I ate that all the way up into my into my 20s. I remember eating that stuff. I used to like that stuff. It tastes good, but it's not good for you, all that. Another little thing just to look at, uh, when you look at a food right here, the sodium is 200 and potassium is 300. That's a no-no. The, the potassium should be much, much higher than the sodium, okay? When you look at, you know, a plant food that has not had things enriching it, it hasn't been processed that much. Potassium, 163, sodium, zero. Okay, the, the potassium norm is gonna be at least 10 to one in most foods. Um, so that's what you want. You really want your final potassium to sodium ratio, probably in the ballpark of, you know, at least 20 to one. Uh, some people say as low as five to one, but all I'm trying to tell you is this is how you can tell what's going on with a food. If there's a lot of iron in it, that's a sign it's highly processed and they're adding iron to it. And it's an inorganic iron. It's a bad type of iron. If the potassium and the sodium are, are similar in amount, that's a bad sign. It indicates a lot of processing. The more you process the food, typically, the higher the sodium goes and the lower the potassium goes. A good plant-based food is usually going to have really high uh, potassium. I won't eat anything that has more than one ingredient. The only thing I eat that has a label on it is uh, plain oatmeal and plain quinoa. That's it. Everything else is just, I'll buy the food, you know, the bean, the potato, the sweet potato. Okay, we talked about men only excreting about one milligram a day, very, very little. Uh, women get more with menstruation, so iron overload is a big deal for men starting when they're 20. For women, as soon as they're postmenopausal, this is just a little more detail on that. When a woman has a baby, she loses more iron too. So a woman who's delivered a baby can be a little bit iron deficient. Uh, women have a tendency to get iron uh, deficient when they go into puberty because they're growing rapidly. So the body needs more iron at that time in their life and they start menstruating. So they're losing more iron from their body. So I'll show you some pictures of that. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Inorganic iron is not bound to carbon. Ligand bound iron is bound to something in a plant, for example. Uh, organic iron is bound to the carbons. Um, and that's especially, you know, with your heme iron. Iron in the body is mostly used for hemoglobin uh, to carry oxygen in the blood, myoglobin to store oxygen in the muscles. There's a lot of cytochrome enzymes that use iron. Um, these are some of them. When you donate blood or when you just have blood drawn off you, you're going to get the red blood cells at the bottom. You're going to get the buffy coat. That's the white blood cells in the middle. There's, very not, there's not many of them. Um, over 99% of the cells in the blood are going to be red blood cells. And you get the plasma up above. If you eat a high fat meal, it becomes opaque. If you ever saw the movie Game Changers about you know vegan diet for uh, athletes and exercising, they had nice pictures of that in the movie. Okay, red blood cells have a negative charge on their outer surface called the zeta potential. And so they repel each other because of that negative charge. It's due to the sialic acids, the glycocalyx. Bottom line, negative charge in the outer surface. Um, then the next thing is um, certain molecules are bridging molecules. They'll overcome the zeta potential and they'll stick these red blood cells together. LDL cholesterol is a big one. That's why it increases the risk of clotting, atherosclerosis. Fibrinogen, the clotting protein, that does it as well. Uric acid, which you can get from excessive uh, liquid fructose sweetened beverages will do it. Um, excessive, you know, meat ingestion will raise uric acid levels. The Yanomamo's got really low uric acids. People living in a, you know, an, an old fashioned uh, plant-based endemic uh, diet. IgM antibodies in the setting of an acute infection, that can be a bridging molecule. And of course the fibrinogen is worse of a problem, more prothrombotic if you got high iron on board or you have an active infection and there's LPS or LTA from the gram negatives and the gram positive bacteria. So the higher the LDL cholesterol, the higher the blood viscosity, the thicker it is. Blood cholesterol definitely does correlate with atherosclerosis. Don't let anybody tell you it doesn't, because I know there's a lot of people on the internet trying to confuse people. You put a person on a bunch of drugs like statins and stuff, and you lower the cholesterol, you can get confused, and they can still sometimes be sick for other reasons, and people get confused by that. Okay, fat makes red blood cells stick together. We talked about that in the blood sludge form or low formation. Red blood cells are pretty unique. They don't have a nucleus, so no DNA. They don't have any ribosomes. They don't do any new protein synthesis. They don't have any mitochondria, so that way there's nothing to steal an oxygen away from the hemoglobin. Most of their energy comes from glycolysis. Um, okay, we talked about how the excess of iron or the endotoxins from gram-negative bacteria, LPS, lipopolysaccharide, or LTA, lipotychoic acid, will cause aggregation of the red blood cells. So we're going to come back to that. So here they are going through a capillary and when they're stuck together by the fat or any of the bridging molecules, it's harder for them to go through and you get more um, higher blood pressure. This was um, from the researcher Roy Swank and Dr. McDougall has this movie at one of his sites here. Here is, you can, you can watch it. 
This is blood sludge after eating a fatty meal. So the point is that the chylomicrons and the LDL cholesterol, depending on the timing, they're going to stick the red blood cells together. And as they're all clumped together, like here, there's big clumps of them, we're low formation. Pressure has to go up to pump that through. Tissues get less oxygen. Uh, it's not a healthy thing. And, okay, when you look at a peripheral smear, a couple points about it. You know, an average hematocrit, let's say, is in the ballpark of 42. It's going to be a little higher or lower than that. Uh, women's tend to run a little lower, like we said, that helps them to lower their blood pressure. Looking at a peripheral smear, the normal red blood cells are going to be about the size of a lymphocyte nucleus. Um, here's a couple more RBC parameters. So here's a, a normal peripheral smear, relatively normal. This lymphocyte nucleus is a little bit bigger than usual. Normally, it'll be about the same size as the red blood cell. Normally, the center will be less than a third of the width of the red blood cell. And this is sort of the hemoglobin red stuff in there. Um, this is a polymorphal nuclear leukocyte, a neutrophil. Uh, so anyways, this is what normal RBCs look like. This is also called the central pallor. All right, so here's an example of some abnormal uh, red blood cells. When there's a lack of hemoglobin in there, somebody's anemic, you can get hypochromia. You can get small uh, red blood cells, microcytes, microcytic, microcytic anemia. Iron deficiency anemia is typically microcytic um, and hypochromic. Okay, when you eat a high fat meal, you can get distortion of the shape of the membrane of the red blood cell. It's called a canthocyte. I remember A for a cantho from asymmetric. An echinocyte, I remember E for equal, equally uh, spaced uh, spurs all over. It's also called a burr cell. Uh, when you have excessive iron, free iron, you'll have a tendency to get these teardrop cells. You can get these other shapes as well. But these are just some of the basic things. Macrocytic anemia, uh, you can get with a B12 deficiency. Okay, so vegans, that's the only thing I take is B12. But probably anybody who's a long-term vegan is going to end up needing to take B12. Okay, single high-fat meal. I talked about this in my recent lecture, um, and that's going to distort the shape. And you're going to get these acanthocytes asymmetrically spurred versus echinocytes uniformly, circumferentially, equidistant spurred all around. So when you distort the shape of a red blood cell, if you distort a lot of them, it's likely your pressure is going to go up. You're going to have decreased uh, tissue oxygenation. It's not a good thing. And we're going to show that with the excessive iron, you get more distortions. So here's a patient where they've added, here's a healthy red blood cell, that normal uh, discoid shape. And here it is a normal thrombin looking like a piece of spaghetti on a normal red blood cell. But when iron is added, you'll get a distortion of the red blood cell. Now you have a teardrop shape and you have this abnormal fibrinogen. It's polymerized into an amyloid configuration. I'm gonna explain amyloid in just a little bit, uh, but it'll end up being an important word. And this is a thicker, denser, more irregular clot and it's gonna be harder to dissolve it. So this is, this is Douglas Cal, this is Etheresia Pretorius, and they did a lot of great, I think they deserve a Nobel Prize for their work. And uh, we'll look at some of it. And you know, what's the reason for talking about all this stuff? You're like wondering, why am I going through all this? Because lowering your serum ferritin level is a way for many people that they can improve their health. Um, and it's pretty easy to do. You don't have to do it in a fast way. You can do it in a gradual way um, and it'll lower your risk of a lot of diseases. Okay, so here's Dr. Zacharski, and he's the guy who really did a lot of pioneering work to figure out that ideal serum ferritin is probably about 30 to 80. Other people will give you wider ranges. If you go to a blood lab, they'll tell you normal upper levels like 300, but that you don't want to go by that. That is not good. A lot of normal levels at conventional labs are sort of based on just, let's say you take 95% of the population, where do they sit? And that's just called normal. It doesn't mean those are healthy people. You don't want to go by that. Um, one nanogram per ml of serum ferritin, that corresponds about 10 milligrams of total body stored iron. So if you had a serum ferritin of 100, that would suggest a total body stored iron of 1,000, which would be reasonable, maybe a touch high, but reasonable. A lot of people, it's much higher than that. For example, my serum ferritin, when I checked it some years ago, was 240. And I was really surprised by that, that it was that high. So I've been working on it since then to lower it. Uh, normal transfer and saturation mean the percentage of those transporter proteins in the blood that are bound to iron should be about 25 to 35 percent in that ballpark. Um, when it gets over 60, you start leaking iron. And you can also diagnose they're probably going to have hemochromatosis. Um, and you, yeah, you get more of this uh, free iron causing all the problems. And I talked about diabetes related glycation of uh, transferrin causing a leak of iron from both transferrin and from ferritin leading to more free iron. That's a problem. All kinds of bad things happen in diabetes. Okay, this is just a painting of what I was talking about. They used to call it love sickness of virgins. 
uh, iron deficiency anemia. Again, because they're in puberty, so they're growing more rapidly. They need more iron for that reason, and they're menstruating, so they're losing iron. And that's a time, you know, when there was no fortified foods and meat and iron were much less available to people. So there was some tendency for that. Okay. And the love sickness of virgins, here's a song, the best love song ever. Thanksgiving song, Johnny Cash. All right. Be careful with iron deficiency anemia. Uh, what is the lower limit of normal for hemoglobin in the bud? It kind of depends on the person's situation and on their symptoms. It's not always just the lab value. And the conclusion of all these uh, iron experts was that they think that iron deficiency anemia, so-called iron deficiency anemia, tends to be overtreated, that the threshold value should be lower. So it's going to depend on the individual. Plus, the person has to be careful. If they keep on taking iron supplements, they might have grown out of that, so to speak, and they can end up quite iron overloaded. Okay. Uh, and so, again, Z Zacharski, the big, uh, he's really good. He recommends keeping your ferritin in about 20 to 80, 30 to 80. And I think that's good advice. That's what I aspire to. Um, these are just other iron experts giving their quotes, and they're all in that ballpark. Much lower than conventional medicine would recommend. Okay, Randall Lawfer, he has a whole bunch of stuff on iron deficiency is the most overdiagnosed, overtreated condition in America, is his opinion. Um, here's some criteria for iron deficiency anemia. You know, maybe a serum ferritin less than 12, transfer and saturation less than 16. Um, so those are some things that they talk about. Okay, these are just more pictures of what's happening. Again, we should only be absorbing about one or two milligrams, and we're only losing about one or two milligrams per day. The one for the man, the two for the woman. Okay, she loses more because of menstruation. And like we said, men start getting overloaded after 20. Women start getting overloaded after menopause. Um, and excessive iron, it's associated with a lot of things you don't want. It increasing your risk of cancer, increasing your risk of coronary artery disease, increasing your risk of diabetes, Increasing your risk of liver failure. Uh, hemochromatosis is a much more uh, severe version of iron overload, especially if it's homozygous instead of just heterozygous. We'll come back to that. But here's another thing people don't know, sperm damage. Um, there's sperm damage from excessive free iron, and you can have a lot of things damaging the sperm. I see a lot of young guys putting their cell phones in their front pocket, not smart. I see a lot of young guys sitting with their laptop computer on their lap. That's a low power microwave transmitter, for example, microwave in their balls, not a smart thing to do. Uh, same thing with the cell phone. Uh, a lot of them are eating excessive amounts of dietary iron. And they're also ingesting chemicals like on the non-organic uh, corn and soy. There's things in there that are not good for fertility. Um, all these estrogenic chemicals are widespread. And a lot of them are in the water if you don't filter your water. So anyways, I think a lot of people. I think much, much, much more people are infertile than is widely recognized. I have a lot of people come and ask me, you know, we're trying to have a baby. What's your advice? Okay. And so be aware of that. There's a lot of things a person could do and not many people know that stuff. Okay. What causes iron overload? Do we talk about meat because the heme iron is much, much more absorbed. Let's say in the ballpark of five times more absorbed, according to some articles. Uh, red meat, by the way, is a slow twitch and uh, white meat is a fast twitch muscle. Okay. So slow twitch is going to have more myoglobin in it. That's why it's red. Because the, the iron-bound uh, myoglobin is going to be reddish, makes the meat red. Okay, plant iron is absorbed in the ballpark of 10%. Let's say heme and iron in the ballpark of 50%. Um, so five times more the heme iron. Plus, we're better at regulating plant iron. We can shut that down better. We can't really shut down heme iron that effectively. So even if you are iron overloaded, you keep eating meat, you'll keep absorbing a lot of it. We talked about all these cereals. So many of them being fortified. People are becoming iron overloaded. We talked about how vitamin C will actually reduce the iron from three plus to two plus in the gut. So more of it gets absorbed. Um, watch out for red wine. It's kind of like a double toxin. I would say the alcohol is toxic to the liver plus the iron it contains is toxic to the liver. You don't want to be cooking off of iron cookware because that can put a lot of iron into your food. You'd be surprised how much it can. Somebody who's decreased their menstruation because of hysterectomy or birth control pills, they're at risk to become iron overloaded. Um, hereditary hemochromatosis is something you can diagnose. The homozygous ones tend to have very high iron levels, like let's say around 600 or even higher. Heterozygous tend to be upper limits in normal, so-called normal range. Um, persons who have repeated blood transfusion for something like uh, Cooley's anemia, beta thalassemia, they'll have a tendency to become quite iron overloaded. And you say, why do these diseases even exist? Why haven't they been uh, removed from the genetic pool because of poor survivorship. And the reason is because a lot of the toxicity doesn't happen until they're older after they've reproduced. Also because for our ancestors in the past, it used to be hard to get enough iron in the diet. 
for many of them. So our body hangs onto that iron very tightly. And so, like I said, be careful about over supplementation because the person always thinks I'll just add supplement E to all these other things to make a good reaction and I'll get healthy. But if you're supplementing something that you don't need, you have a tendency to activate the wrong pathway and you'll activate a secondary pathway that's toxic to your body. So when people take unnecessary supplements, they have a tendency to side effects. So you got to be careful with that. Okay. Primary hemochromatosis, also called hereditary hemochromatosis. It's diagnosed uh, hereditary hemochromatosis, the homozygous version, meaning you have a copy from both your mother and your father when your, your transfer saturation is greater than 62%. And they'll discover these in about one out of 200 people when they go to donate blood, that their transfer and saturation will be too high. Um, it's more common in the iris. Some people even call it the iris disease. And what do they think is the reason for that? Maybe for some genetic mutation, but also maybe just because they had a harder time getting iron in the diet. So it was more favored in their genetic pool because people needed to hang on to iron. They weren't able to get it as much as they would like from their environment. And so hemochromatosis causes all kinds of problems and it's just more common than realized. So it's worth knowing your ferritin level. I would say, you know, you definitely want to know your total cholesterol level. I think you also should at least once get your uh, ferritin level checked, see where you're at. Um, and then you can gradually work it down if you need to. You can consider donating blood. There's a little more to it than that. I'll talk about that more in this lecture. Um, people with hemochromatosis, if they get the phlebotomy started before they had irreversible, irreversible damage, let's say to their liver, their pancreas, they can have a normal life expectancy because otherwise they tend to die a miserable early death. Um, let's see, um, how to reduce iron levels. Okay, here's this guy, Jim Moon, PhD, iron expert, biochemist. And he said, the decision to add iron to the food is the greatest mistake in the entire history of human nutrition. And the decision to use inorganic iron, not bound to anything, is the second worst. So he really thinks it's a bad idea putting uh, iron in all these cereals and grains. Um, let's see, absorption rates. Like we said, the human gets overabsorbed. Um, organic, you know, we're better able to control that, let's say from the plants, eating, this is how you reduce iron levels. Eat 100% low-fat vegan diet with nothing enriched, all right? And watch out for raisins. They can have a little bit of a high iron level. Um, certain things like phytate and some wheat bran and rye, they help to prevent you from absorbing it. Um, avoid all processed foods, is my advice, other than plain oatmeal with water or plain quinoa with water. Lots of them are fortified with iron. That's bad, okay? Um, avoid iron cookware. Exercise more. You do lose a little bit of iron in your sweat. Um, and then consider donating blood if you're really high in iron. If like if you've got hemochromatosis, you'll you'll definitely be recommended to donate blood. Some people say the real benefit of aspirin is that you bleed a little bit in your intestinal tract, and that lowering of your hemoglobin gradually has a therapeutic benefit. You know, I don't know about that. I'm not going to get into aspirin. Okay, I don't take it, but I, I there's a whole bunch of arguments pro and con on that. Um, if your doctor lets you, you can, you know, let's say you have to have blood labs, ask them to pull off a couple extra tubes just to take your iron off a little bit. I'll talk more about actual blood donation, which is going to be a larger volume of blood removal. Um, good foods are some of these things like we've talked about, not enriched with iron. Uh, bad foods are things that are kind of high in iron. Really bad food is the worst is like a beef, um, fried. <laughs> Okay, we talked about redox cycling, how the iron changes its valence from two plus to three plus and it loses an electron and then in that process and it gives it off to oxygen and the net result is generating these hydroxyl radicals which are very damaging, okay? Here's just a little more detail if you're interested in the, in the, the chemical reactions involved in that. Okay, here's where you know the, the things are happening. Electron transport chain of a mitochondria, leak of an electron comes down to oxygen, makes a superoxide. Superoxide is typically neutralized by superoxide dismutase, but in the setting of high iron, some of this stuff can get converted into hydroxyl radicals by the Fenton reaction with excessive free iron. So just a reminder what it does. You'll notice people got spots on their skin, on their hands, those big brown spots. Those are called lipofuscin spots. They're also called liver spots because they're about the same color we thought of the liver, about the color of this ink right here. And they're also called aging spots. They look like a giant freckle, like five times bigger than a regular freckle. And so when you see somebody's got that, you know, it, it just makes them look older. The medical name for them officially is like lentigo or lentigenes. Um, they're due to like oxidation of the skin associated with our iron overload and excessive oxidative stress. So the point I'm saying is that high iron levels make you age faster and they make you look older. You get more liver spots. We talked about how iron overload is associated with sperm damage. You don't want that. It also increases the risk of arthritis. Um, you ever heard the expression starve a fever? What I think that might be about is 
when you're not absorbing new iron, you will lower your iron levels. And that helps to prevent, uh, let's say, a bacterial infection from progressing. Okay. When the blood pH is a little bit acidic, transferrin starts to leak some iron. So that's another bad thing about blood acidity. The human body holds iron to control infection. That's a big, major, important thing. So anything toxic to your liver, like getting a fatty liver, is going to increase the chance your liver cells start dying, becoming fibrosis, progressing to cirrhosis, and um, start leaking iron in your blood. And you'll have more problems. And I can tell you, fatty liver is so common that if somebody tells me a patient has elevated LFTs, in my experience, by far, the most common thing it is, is fatty liver, all right? Uh, I see fatty liver all the time. I see it all the time when people aren't even looking for fatty liver. They'll come in for kidney stones, tons of them. They got fatty liver. Uh, it's super, super common. They'll come in and get a cat scan of their abdomen for abdominal pain or some other reason. Super common. They got fatty liver. It can, of course, also be caused by alcohol. Um, high fat diet will cause it too. Tons and tons of dietary fructose, like in those, uh, some of those drinks. Uh, it's a common cause of uh, fatty liver as well. By now, we kind of got this uh, figured out. So again, here's a duodenal absorption. There's a ferroportin that can let it in on the transferrin. Transferrin is a little boat, travels it around to go to the bone marrow or to the liver or other locations. Hepcidin from the liver blocking the ferroportin door so the iron can't get into the body. And then this duodenal enterocyte holds it for about three days. And if this door is continually blocked, it'll just slough off into the gut and will defecate it out of the body. Okay, so again, typically ferritin is intracellular but some of it gets into the blood when there's cell damage. So if you have a big liver injury for whatever the reason, like from alcoholism, you'll be leaking more and more of this ferritin in the blood and it can release lots of iron in your blood, cause a lot of this free iron, it can cause all kinds of problems. Okay, the Bantu population used to cook on iron pans and they had really high iron levels. They don't do that anymore. Um, when somebody's iron deficient, they got iron deficiency anemia, they're gonna have a low serum ferritin. When they're iron overloaded, they'll have a high serum ferritin. So, um, that's the lab, like I said, that's worth checking. If you donate blood, one unit of packed red blood cells will have about 250 milligrams of iron. That's about how much you're getting rid of if you donate a full unit. Um, these are some of the indications. If, of course, your iron's really low, but I'd go by my ferritin. If my ferritin was high, I would consider donating. Um, your goal is to get your ferritin down. Some say below 100, some say below 80. I donated blood a couple of years ago and I kind of screwed up because I did it on a whim in a hurry. I had not hydrated and I felt lightheaded afterwards because I read a lot of these books and they all say, oh, you'll feel great. You'll feel great. Donors high, all this stuff. And I'm like, well, BS. I felt tired and I laid down for 30 minutes. But again, I had screwed up. I did not hydrate myself before it. Um, if, I ever, if I ever donate blood again, I'll hydrate before it. The other thing you do is you can ask your doctor and some doctors will say, yeah, go ahead, take off a couple extra tubes. And you make these little mini donations every time you donate blood. And that's a nice thing to do if your doctor lets you do it because uh, you can kind of gradually get it down. Also, when you donate blood, you don't need to donate a full unit, which is about a pint, you know, 450 to 500 cc's. You can donate, you know, half of that if the place will let you, like 250 cc's. Cc is the same thing as a milliliter. Uh, and that's what I would do the first time and see how you tolerate it if they let you. Um, or better yet, just if you have to go in for labs periodically, you know, to check your cholesterol, check your ferret and whatever, just ask them to pull off a couple extra tubes. That's a smaller amount than this. So it's a way to do it more gradually. And again, stop eating anything that's going to iron overload you. So Lawfer says less than 1% of patients faint. <laughs> okay. Why do premenopausal women have fewer heart attacks? We talked about all that stuff. It's not cholesterol because men and women tend to have similar total cholesterols. So that's not it. It's not because estrogen is protective. Estrogen is actually a little bit prothrombotic. So it's not the estrogen. Estrogen is also obesogenic. So that's not what's protecting them from myocardial infarction, you know, heart disease, coronary artery blockage. Um, meat has tons of things that promote cancer and promote coronary artery disease. There's a very good reason. I actually think that's one of the signs of somebody who knows nutrition. The more you know nutrition, the more obvious it is to be 100% vegan. And somebody who tells you that it's not, they really haven't studied that much yet. That's one of those key distinguishing features. You can tell somebody knows what they're talking about. Somebody says you know, eat the Mediterranean diet, run for your life. They're either an ignoramus or they're a liar because it, it's a bad diet. And that's like the most commonly recommended thing by people who have not really studied nutrition too much. Um, let's see, the, again, the, the additive effect, if you got a high cholesterol and a high serum ferritin, watch out, that's a real high risk for coronary artery disease. 
Okay. Um, here was the guy who wrote the landmark paper, Jerome Sullivan, back in 1981, about the major risk of uh, men versus women in the high iron. But again, I think it's some of the hematocrit effect as well in a big way. Okay. Um, association or reduction in cardiovascular events. Yeah, like I said, the greatest atherosclerosis research in the world, he reduces his cardiovascular risk by donating blood, Gregory Sloop. And I talked to him and I said, you know what? You ought to be a low-fat vegan. I said, you keep donating blood. Every time you donate blood, they stick you, let's say, in the antecubital fossa right here by the elbow. You get a little scarring in the vein. I said, well, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get progressive scarring in those veins and everybody's going to think you're a drug addict, okay? Because that's where they poke around, you know? Or, you know, somebody who's, who's had tons of medical stuff, go low-fat vegan is the fastest way. And donate blood when you need to, but you won't have to keep doing it all the time. Okay, comparison to the iron profile in patients with or without coronary disease. Yeah, they got much higher serum ferritins when they are uh, the patients with high risk of coronary artery disease. Okay, iron stores, international variant. Okay, this is something. Um, oh, this is by Laufer. He, he came up, he wrote some good papers about the correlation of high serum ferritins with coronary artery disease. And we talked about the reasons already. Uh, when you have a ferritin over 200, okay, normally, again, we talked about it should be less than 100 or less than 80 you have a more than two times increased risk of myocardial infarction. Okay, now we're going to talk about iron and diabetes. So we're going to work our way through some of the things that iron is associated with, and then we'll talk about the relationship between iron and cancer and the relationship between iron and dementia. We're sort of building towards that. This is all the buildup towards how iron will make you stupid with dementia and also will uh, worsen your cancer risk. Okay, iron overload of rats, they get more diabetes. Iron overloaded humans have more diabetes. Um, and you can get synergistically negative effects with these high fat diets and the omega-6 oils, lipid peroxidation. That was thought based on my study of the research on the subject, especially the papers by Fitzamori Yamashima, that that might be the reason why a lot of persons from India have a high risk of diabetes is because they eat too much oils and they're getting lipid peroxidation in the beta cells in their pancreas. Um, and that could be a cause of their insulin resistance and, uh, diabetes, Okay. High fat diet in general, especially saturated fat, causes insulin resistance. Okay. In general, with uh, excessive dietary fat, especially sat fat, this research paper here was showing that the fat was getting across the plasma membrane and the skeletal muscle cells, and it was sort of overwhelming the skeletal muscle cell. They tried inhibiting the plasma membrane uh, fat transporters like CD36, but it didn't make any difference. It was just coming through the membrane. They believe the mechanism is something called a flip-flop maneuver. Basically, a normal fatty acid has a negative charge on it, deprotonated to physiologic pH, but it can become protonated, neutral, um, get itself into the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane, and then flip-flop to the inner leaflet and then enter the cytoplasm. So the bottom line is you want to minimize your risk of insulin resistance. Smart move is avoid uh, this dietary fat, especially uh, saturated fat. The other thing is you'll hear people say, what about the ketogenic diet? Problem with the ketogenic diet is you're maybe reducing your carbohydrate intake, which can get your sugars down a little bit, but you're still insulin resistance and you're going to have all the problems related to insulin resistance. I don't think that's a smart way to go. Okay, uh, diabetes is really a disease about fat. People call it sugar diabetes, sugar disease, but it's really a disease about fat. You start accumulating fat in the skeletal muscle that causes resistance in the skeletal muscle and you'll get postprandial after eating hyperglycemia. You'll gradually accumulate more fat in the liver and then the liver loses its ability to sense the blood glucose level. And uh, whew, that surprised me. All right, I gotta get, let me get this out of here. Hold on a second. I hope you guys are enjoying this. I feel like I'm attending medical school. Sorry about that. No worries. No worries. All right. Um, so then the fat starts accumulating the pancreas. And then the pancreas, um, it goes into several different things. There's something called endoplasmic reticulum stress, but you start losing the beta cells. All right. So bottom line is this fat accumulation. And Gerald Shulman's probably the best researcher in the world these days. He's the guy from Yale who did the NMR spectroscopy to show accumulation of fat in the skeletal muscle cell was the first detectable finding in insulin resistance. And he calls it the ectopic fat theory of diabetes. And that's that's the best, most important cause of insulin resistance. There's other things as we spoke about earlier, but that's key to know. Um, and then you get all these secondary complications of diabetes. All right, serum ferritin levels, an independent predictor of insulin resistance. So again, 
You can predict all these bad things by seeing an elevated serum ferritin. And part of this could be an association with meat, but there's also an independent component of it that we, we sort of spoke about. We're going to go into more detail here in just a moment. So let's see a whole bunch of papers, tons of stuff. Increase ferritin, increase insulin resistance, okay? Uh, ferritin correlating with insulin resistance, abdominal obesity. You could basically almost think of it as being part of metabolic syndrome. Okay, this was the guy, Zacharski, like I showed you some of the people who've done some of the great research. He devoted his life to studying iron and uh, figuring out where to put that ferritin level, which is really important because you have to decide where do you want to titrate your ferritin level down to? And I think that's a great range, 25 to 80. If you go below 25, you worry about getting things like uh, restless leg syndrome. Uh, but I used to think, oh, you could probably get by just being below 200. But reading his papers and some of these other experts, it convinced me, no, nah, you want to get below 100. So I'm working towards that. I just drew mine a couple of days ago, but I couldn't get the lab results in time to to present them today. I really wanted to. Um, ferritin percent trans. Okay, we talked about this. Normal uh, transfer and saturation in this ballpark. Uh, he says you can have a little higher than that. Diabetes is very prothrombotic. We're not going to get into all the pathophysiology of it. Maybe someday I'll give a lecture on this and go into just diabetes because it's a fascinating disease. Bottom line, it's a disaster. Um, and it's almost entirely, if you just got standard type 2 diabetes, you can cure it by going low-fat vegan. That's what you want to do. Uh, rather than drag it out slowly with pills, unless you have to. Um, and then you run the risk of all these complications. Okay, so we're talking about uh, the mitochondrial memory, and that, of course, is getting me back into diabetes. What I'm going to talk about here is uh, once you get excessive dietary fat, you're going to block complex uh, four here, and you're going to get a, back, a backflow of all these in complex three. You're going to get a backflow of all these electrons. It's going to just reverse, okay? And then you're going to have problems reversing Krebs cycle and glycolysis. They can't run when this is all backed up. You can run glycolysis anaerobically, but this backup in reactions is going to lead to a problem in glycolysis. That's what I'm going to show on the next slide here. So this is the enzyme, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So this enzyme right here gets blocked in glycolysis. And then you start running a side reaction. You're going to produce something called methyl glyoxyl, MGO. And MGO is what produces your advanced glycation end products. And the name of it is perfect, ages, because it ages you. These cause damage, damage to multiple structures in your body. And this is going to connect into diabetes and iron. So here's what it's about. This is glucose. This is the open form. Here's a reactive oxygen, reactive hydroxyl group. And here's when it forms a ring. And it'll usually spend most of its time in the ring form, but it'll open and close and cycle back and forth from what is called the alpha form and the beta form of the cyclic ring of glucose. All right, and the relevance being is when it's in this open form, it can react with things. It can react with proteins. And this is what glycation is. It'll then bind to this nitrogen here on the side chain. And this is now a glycated protein. When that happens in your collagen, it becomes stiff. It also stiffens up your hemoglobin, your red blood cells, and that causes your blood pressure to go up. When it stiffens your collagen, that'll damage collagen in multiple locations in the body. Collagen is the most common protein in the body. It's about one third of your bodily protein. And it's sort of the glue that holds the whole human body together. So, you know, part of aging is to stiffen up your collagen. You don't want to do that. Um, this is just showing non-enzymatic. When you glycate the transfer and iron transport protein in the blood or ferritin, the iron storage protein, you're going to start leaking more iron and you're going to get more NTBI, non-transferrin bound iron. That's bad, which is going to mean more oxidative stress and damage to tissues. Um, also, the transferrin also is a carrier protein for chromium. Chromium is a chemical needed to improve insulin sensitivity. So it's a double whammy worsening your insulin resistance by having elevated iron. Okay, this is a bit of a fancy diagram, but I, the whole point of this is just these advanced glycation end products. You get elevated MGO, methyl glyoxyl, and that will glycate things inside the cell. It then exits the cell and it starts glycating proteins in the blood. And uh, it will also, like I said, glycate the hemoglobin. It'll glycate transferrin in the blood. It'll glycate ferritin and intracellular. It can glycate ferritin in the blood. And it causes all these secondary problems. You also get advanced glycation end products from dietary, from cooking meat, especially high protein foods, especially. Um, and this is a major cause of damage in the body, especially the diabetics. It's normal to have some of it and our body can clear it in small amounts, but in big amounts, it causes a lot of problems. So here's diabetes, hyperglycemia, glycating transfer. And that's what the TF stands for. The glycated transfer and starts leaking iron. And then you get more NTBI, non-transferrin bound iron. Then that free iron starts causing cells to die through ferroptosis, running the Fenton reaction to produce more hydroxyls, hydroxyl radicals 
including in the pancreas, destroying pancreatic beta cells, leading to permanent diabetes, insulin-dependent diabetes, sort of end-stage type 2 diabetes, all right? You also can't carry the chromium because you have damaged your transferrin proteins by glycation, and that'll cause more insulin resistance. In addition, because you can't sequester the iron as effectively, now the bacteria have increased access to the iron. So in a sense, you're immune suppressed. You're more vulnerable to bacterial infections and other infections. Plus, there's all the generalized inflammation caused by the advanced glycation end products, both the ones produced by diabetes and the ones taken in through the diet, especially from high meat diet. Okay. Okay. Um, with time, you know, the big thing for the red blood cells is to deliver oxygen to the tissue. So here's red blood cells passing through a capillary. They fold back on themselves slightly, deform a little bit in order to deliver the uh, oxygen. The blue circles here are the oxygen passing out of the capillary. These are capillary endothelial cells with a typical spindle shape. There's a nucleus. Uh, these are the vascular smooth muscles adjacent to the capillary, let's say in the arterioles. But anyways, the oxygen gets across, goes with tissue, let's say in your brain going to a neuron. This is how it should be, all right? Um, this is the capillary basement membrane, the yellow part. Well, in diabetes, that becomes thickened. It also becomes thickened in hypertension. In hypertension, you start growing a lot more of these muscles too. The smooth muscles become hypertrophic. All of these things, as this wall gets thicker, it makes it harder to deliver oxygen to the tissues. So when you have tissue that becomes hypoxic, it's more at risk to develop cancer. The tissue is more at risk to die. It's more at risk to be dysfunctional. So this diabetes hypertension stuff progressively damages tissue all throughout the body. Okay, here's the brain. This is the um, hippocampus, our memory center. And this is the cornu amnon part one, very sensitive to deficiency of oxygen. So this can be damaged very easy. It's also very sensitive to excitotoxins. So all of these metabolic problems, they're putting you at increased risk to damage the hippocampus. And diabetes, I talk to a lot of diabetics. So many of them are cognitively impaired. It's not even funny. And one of the things that was not previously known is that the neurons in the brain and the hippocampus in particular, they are insulin resistant. Um, they can develop insulin resistance, it's a big deal. They got glucose type four transporters, meaning that normally these are sequestered in a cytoplasmic vesicle and they go up to the plasma membrane when the cell needs more uh, glucose. With insulin resistance, they can't do that. They will not be transported up to the plasma membrane. So what that means is it's hard for a neuron to get all the glucose it needs when it is high, has a high rate of metabolic activity. So remember that a diabetic neuron in the hippocampus cannot get as much glucose as it wants when it has a ramped up demand. And you're going to need to ramp up your demand sometime. Let's say you're walking down a path in the forest and you see a bunch of coyotes. You're like, uh oh, what am I going to do? Climb a tree? How am I going to fight off the coyotes? What can I do? Scare them away? All right. So, anyways, you have to go from zero to 60 miles per hour, so to speak, in neuronal activity. And a diabetic, somebody with insulin resistance, will have a hard time getting enough glucose into that neuron. Okay. The glucose type one and glucose type three. Uh, glucose transporters, they don't depend on insulin, so they don't matter. Everybody used to think the brain just had glucose type 1 in the blood-brain barrier, glucose type 3 transporters on the neurons. They didn't realize they had glucose type 4, but now it's well known. There's glucose type 4 transporters, hippocampal neurons, some of your cortical neurons, and your substantia nigra, Parkinson's disease-related neurons. So it ends up being a big deal. And so here's why it's a big deal as well. You've got something called an endoplasmic reticulum, which also stores calcium in the cytoplasm. And the endoplasmic reticulum has something called a MAM. It's a mitochondria-associated membrane that um, extends right up adjacent to the mitochondria. And when you have to go from zero to 60 miles per hour because you just saw a coyote or a wolf in the forest, it lets calcium rush into the mitochondria, and that upregulates the Krebs cycle enzymes very rapidly. So you can rapidly make a response. But the problem is, in a diabetic with insulin resistance, it's not coordinated to glucose uptake and they can't get enough glucose in. Like we talked about it, these glucose type four transporters can't go up to the plasma membrane. So what that means is in a diabetic with a lot of insulin resistance, poorly controlled, they're gonna be pouring lots of calcium into their mitochondria and they're not able to get enough glucose in there to really run these enzymatic cycles like Krebs cycle is also called the TCA cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle adequately with the net result being that this mitochondria is often injured by excessive calcium intake. And this is another way, losing your brain mitochondria is bad, all right? So this is another way that diabetics become cognitively impaired over time. All right, now we're going to talk about iron and cancer. So iron, you know, according to Jim Moon, he wrote one of these books, a really good book on uh, iron chemistry. He feels that it's the worst carcinogen in the world. Now, every specialist tends to exaggerate their own field a little bit, but he says it's one of the worst in the world because it increases cancer in all three ways, in initiation, in promotion, in metastases. Um, a good thing to think about cancer is like, think of it as transformation of a human cell into something like a bacteria that's only out for itself. Um, so I'm gonna show a bunch more pictures here. 
Okay, again, like a bacteria, you want to keep iron away from it because cancer cannot grow without iron. So here's the first stage of cancer initiation. The classic way of thinking about that was uh, like the somatic mutation theory and that they think uh, you know, something that causes a DNA mutation is the main cause of cancer. And they said that some chemicals or viruses will mutate the DNA and that's the main cause of cancer. I actually think the metabolic theory of cancer, I can abbreviate that MTC is a much better explanation of cancer causation. Um, you can have both factors contributing. And this is where the bacteria reverts to an anaerobic phase, like a bacteria. Uh, the, the, the normal cell becomes like a bacteria, like an anaerobic bacteria. Um, and that's the Warburg effect, hypoxia inducing, destroying oxidative metabolism with oxygen and now switching into anaerobic metabolism without oxygen and the cell becoming like a, a bacteria. Bacteria just wants to grow for itself. It doesn't care. A normal cell in the body, like let's say you're a liver cell, you got a job to do. You got to do what a liver cell does. It detoxifies things and manages the blood glucose level, the glycogen. It's pretty busy, makes bile. Uh, cancer cell says, hey, I don't got enough energy. I don't can't use oxygen. I just want to grow for myself. I want to get out of here, find a new place to live. All right. So it just tries to grow and spread. Um, it no longer keeps its relationship to the adjacent cells. It tries to take over its local environment and spread to other places. And so that's the initial event. And no one can see that with a microscope or a CAT scan or an MRI. Tumor promotion is when the cancer grows and it gets bigger and bigger until it's about a centimeter or bigger. That's about when we can usually see them. And there's a lot of things that make cancers grow. Estrogenics make uh, hormonal cancers more likely to grow, but iron is a tumor promoter. That's why you want to reduce your intake of iron if you're trying to prevent cancer. Or if you had cancer, if I did, I would want to lower my iron levels, get them down into that safe range, whereas Charsky recommends we beat. Um, so, and then, you know, by avoiding the high fat diet, the high animal protein diet, you lower mTOR, which is sort of the nutrient sensing pathway that promotes cell replication. These are all things you can do to decrease your risk of tumor promotion. And I gave previous lectures on cancer. What I would do if I had cancer, I would try to minimize everything that activates mTOR. Iron activates mTOR, bad. High fat diet activates mTOR, bad. Okay, animal protein activates mTOR, bad. I don't want mTOR activated because it's going to tell the cell to replicate. You don't want the cancer cells replicating. So to the extent you can, that's a useful strategy. Um, continued hypoxia can create an environment favorable to the cancer. An acidic milieu can create an environment favorable to the cancer favorable to the cancer. So we're not going to get into all this cancer stuff, but I just wanted to mention a little bit of the stuff. Let me see what time it is. I don't know what time it is. Oh, see if I got a clock. I mean, you have some time left. Don't worry. Okay. I'm doing okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so basically this was a big experience. This guy, Thomas Seyfried wrote a great book, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease. He's got some good lectures. I'll give him credit for that. He did some great research and he's a good speaker, smart guy. I think he's out of Boston. So a normal cell is right here. It replicates and you can see everything's green. With a cancer cell, it divides, and people used to think, oh, it's because of the DNA, it's because of the DNA. That's what would be suggested by the somatic mutation theory. But what they found is, if you have a hybrid cell where you mix cytoplasm and um, mitochondria with DNA, the nucleus, that cell will grow normally. So whether or not it's growing is dependent on the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. Okay, that matches the, um, the metabolic theory of cancer. That does not match the mutation theory. And then if you did it the other way around, where you just changed the cytoplasm and the mitochondria, but kept the normal DNA, you would get cancer growth. So that's important to know. That's why I think the metabolic theory is so helpful. It tells you what to do. It tells you to avoid everything that's going to push you into metabolic uh, growth. You know, things that are toxic to mitochondria, uh, things that create a favorable cancerous milieu, acidic, hypoxic. You don't want that. And this is just a reminder. There's a lot of things that damage mitochondria and we can't avoid completely being exposed to all these things. So that's why you want to be strict about avoiding everything you can. Because people sometimes tell me, you know, like I've had some family members tell me, oh, you're like a robot. That's why you're so careful about your diet. No regular person is going to be that careful. One of my kids said to me, dad, you're kidding yourself. Nobody's going to ever eat a diet like you, your Spartan vegan diet. I'm like, you don't understand, pal. A lot of people are worried about being sick and they want to do it. And the reason I do it is because I study this stuff so extensively. And it's obvious to me, I want to optimize everything I can control because you can't control all these other things. All right. So there's always going to be some potential problems. Okay. And so you want to control what you can. Um, and it reminds me of a story. My kid came to me one time, he was like in grade school or something. And he said, Oh, the teacher was unfair, gave him a bad grade on some paper and that's not fair and all this stuff and how life's not fair. And I go, yeah, life a lot of times is not fair. I said, imagine you're like a rabbit, you know, hopping down the bunny trail and you see there's a hawk over there. There's a snake over there, some coyotes over there, a fox over there. 
the rabbit can never expect that they're going to be nice to him. The rabbit has to learn how to be smart and know how to avoid them. Have a system of burrows, have a system of friends, pay attention to the birds to alert you. You just have to understand life and deal with it. It's just the way it is. You know, people tell me, oh, don't be so negative. Don't be so paranoid about your health. I go, no, all this stuff is out there. And that's why I'm talking about it and teaching about it, because most of the stuff you can avoid it to a great extent and make yourself healthier. So you want to know about it. It is worthwhile. You are like the rabbit. So am I. We all are. You know, there's things out there in a dangerous environment and we learn how to avoid them. And then we optimize our health and we live as long as we can and as healthy as we can. Okay. Excessive iron here also can damage complex four. Um, excessive copper can also function similar to um, iron. Okay. The big mutation of uh, cancer is when you switch over to our anaerobic glycolysis. Okay. And you, you start running on this enzyme called hexokinase two, and that will attach to the mitochondria and it starts hogging the AT ATP coming off that mitochondria. The, the remaining mitochondrial ATP production is left. The cancer doesn't completely lose all of its mitochondrial ATP production. And there's a great book about this called Tripping Over the Truth by Travis Christofferson. I think that's the best book for introduction to um, the biochemistry of cancer. Um, he starts going down that path of ketogenic stuff. And I'm like, oh, no, he doesn't understand certain things. And I'll show you other reasons why that's a bad idea. Um, here is a cancer cell. So glucose comes into the cell. It runs through glycolysis. End product of glycolysis, pyruvate. Pyruvate is then sent into the uh, mitochondria as acetyl-CoA. The one carbon is decarboxylated off of it. And then it runs through Krebs cycle. Okay, And then it runs electron transport. Um, in a cancerous cell, it's not going to go down this path. It's just going to extrude lactate from the cell and protons. But the reason why you can't, some people say, oh, you just want to lower your blood glucose. No, it's not that simple. Because if you lower your blood glucose so, too much, you cause brain damage, okay? But then here's the other pitfall. Here's a major pitfall. And people don't know this. Most people don't know this. This is a very valuable thing to know. Glutamine can just come in the back door. It's an amino acid. It's like the most common amino acid in the body. And it can run everything off of glutamine. So you're not going to win the game just focusing on glucose. You need, you're need you not going to win the game with glucose. You need to know that, that glutamine has to be dealt with. And that's why I think you're, you're kidding yourself if, if you think glucose is, is the name of the game. It's not. All right, here's a normal cell. A normal cell is mostly a worker. Think of a normal cell as, you know, it's blue collar, doing manual labor all day, working its tail off. That's what it's like to be a liver cell, okay? Uh, but a cancer cell is different. A cancer cell is more like, screw this. I'm not doing any work. I just want to grow and spread to other places and figure out where I want to make my main place to live. So a cancer cell is very much into synthesis. It's going to be making lots of proteins. It's going to be making lots of nucleic acids. You need iron to be making all these nucleic acids. If the cell cannot get enough iron, it cannot make extra DNA. So it cannot replicate. So that's why I think this is good to know. Okay, again, here's an anaerobic bacteria. You know, let's say extruding lactate as its end product. Um, here is a normal human cell. It's going to run on oxygen metabolism, aerobic metabolism in the mitochondria, making tons of ATP, and it can do lots of work. Here is a cancer cell, very much like our anaerobic bacteria. It's transformed into running on this anaerobic metabolism. And like I said, here's glutamine coming in the back door to provide uh, energy and carbon skeletons for all the things it needs to do. Okay, now why am I showing this? Because of this right here. The transferrin receptors, the iron receptors on the plasma membrane, these can be increased a thousand fold, all right? This cell wants iron. It's going to be sucking up iron as much as it can. It wants to steal all the iron for itself and prevent the cells around it from getting it. Cancer basically is like a bully that takes over uh, its local neighborhood, its milieu, and steals food away from all the surrounding cells. And uh, one of the big things it does is it sucks in iron like a vacuum, all right. It also sucks in glucose like a vacuum. That's why the FDG PETS uh, fluoro dioxide glucose test is used because it'll be taking up 100 times as much glucose. But it's also doing a similar thing with iron. That's why you want to know this because you can reduce your iron pretty easily by blood donation, for example. Um, there's other things that happen. You know, like I said, it's pumping hydrogen protons into its extracellular matrix, creating an acidotic milieu. Not good. Um, and that also helps to favor cancer growth over the surrounding cells. That's why I also think it's probably a good idea to do what you can to avoid other things that are making you acidotic. Again, a plant-based diet is more alkaline. Um, also, you know, avoiding the sodium chloride. The chloride will displace bar carbonate ions in the blood and lead you a little bit of, you know, mild metabolic acidosis sort of favoring this, you know, pro-cancer milieu, which you don't want. Okay, and then you want to avoid all the things that increase insulin-like growth factor. Of course, that's a big thing with meat and all that stuff. And that going to lead to activating mTOR telling the cell to replicate. No, no, no. You want to minimize all those things as much as you can. 
Okay, a little bit about what causes cancer too. For example, let's say you inhale an asbestos fiber into your lung. The body forms a fibrotic reaction around it to wall it off so it can't cause any more damage. But that scar tissue, typically called fibrosis, you know, collagen, acellular collagen, um, it'll also block oxygen to some, some cells get trapped in there that might survive a while initially. And some of those from that hypoxia can be transformed into cancer. So I'm sort of given a mechanism of cancer causation related to hypoxia induced by scarring. Some other interesting things about cancer. If you look at Papua New Guinea, they were eating about 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes, I think, are the best food in the world. It's only 1% fat. It's about 4.5% protein. You know, being a plant, you're going to have potassium and you're going to have magnesium in there. And the relevance is the Papua New Guinea population smoke like chimneys, and so do the Japanese. But despite all that, they had Papua New Guinea had six times less cancer than Americans who smoked similar to them or less. Okay, so why was the American getting six times more lung cancer compared to the Papua New Guinea? And it was thought that because they were eating the SAD diet, the high cholesterol being synergistic, the higher hypoxia of cells because of the high fat diet. I also think because the higher iron levels are going to have more oxidative stress and the procarcinogenic features of excessive iron, more free iron, and the lack of the plant foods, the lack of the antioxidants, you know, the acidic milieu. So that's interesting. The Americans were worse off than these other populations. One also has to be careful, is there pollution? You know, I don't know how significant that might be, but, you know, living next to some factories, coal burning electrical plant or whatever it might be, that might be contributing. You know, if I had to, I would probably get an air filter in my house, which isn't going to remove everything, but it can maybe move things in a positive direction, a HEPA air filter, for example. Um, let's see what else. Just like the egg white, um, prevents bacteria from growing. Remember cancer is a lot like an anaerobic bacteria and you minimize iron to it. That can help prevent it from growing. Ooh, I missed a page here. I just can show the same thing happens in the liver. You start out with a normal liver tissue, it gets fatty. The fat gets uh, scarring in it, fibrosis from with the collagen and whatnot. The fibrosis eventually gets called cirrhosis. You get little bumps on the surface of the liver, surface nodularities, suggestive of cirrhosis. And that'll cause localized areas of hypoxia. Some of those cells can be transformed into cancer. They found that patients with hepatitis or cirrhosis, the higher their iron levels, the more likely their cancer was to grow. Um, and this is sort of from Jim Moon's book right here, uh, Cancer is the Most Toxic Metal. He felt that cancer is like one of the all-time worst carcinogens in his opinion because it increases initiation phase, promotion phase, and spreading metastatic phase. Damages intermitochondrial membrane contributing to a Warburg-like effect. Damages DNA through its hydroxyl radical production when there's excessive free iron contributing to a mutation-like effect. So this is sort of like a mix of somatic mutation theory, metabolic theory of cancer. Also, for cells to replicate, they need a lot of iron to grow. That's why they suck it up like a vacuum cleaner with increased transfer and receptors on their cell surface. So it contributes to the promotion phase. And then also it's involved in the metastatic spread. Um, I think more for the same reason, it's taking up more iron, but he described that as being a separate thing, that it contributed to all three phases. So he thought it was uniquely bad carcinogen. Um, Eugene Weinberg wrote a lot about that as well. And that guy, Baruch Bloomberg, he won the Nobel Prize for showing how um, elevated iron increases, uh, markedly increases incidence of liver cancer. Okay. And then it'll increase, you know, just the dietary intake of it, even the part that's not absorbed is going to be causing these redox effects in the colon and increasing the risk of colon cancer. Um, iron by itself increases activation of mTOR. mTOR is mammalian target of rapamycin. And that comes from them sort of figuring this out related to like a fungus they work from, from Rapa Nui, the island of Rapa Nui, which is like Easter Island. And really, mTOR is a nutrient sensing pathway, like a contractor getting ready to build a house. It doesn't build until it has all the building materials available. And they tend to be leucine, amino acid, more common in meat, branched chain amino acid. The amino acid composition of meat and plants is different. Uh, meat's got a lot more branched chain amino acids, like uh, leucine, for example. Also, it needs uh, methionine and it needs iron too. So these are things that help activate mTOR. And it's activated more when there's high fat in the diet. That's all the fat in the diet. All those things activate mTOR. You don't want mTOR activated because it tells the cell to replicate. You want the contractor saying, oh, screw it. I don't got enough iron. Can't grow. You know, who knows? Maybe next month. We'll see. All right. Cancer needs iron to make electron transport proteins, to make all the cytochrome proteins, to make DNA synthesis enzymes. This is just a little rehash of some of the reactions here. Um, the the Torty, so this, this uh, you know, both of the Torties, they wrote in some good papers on iron and cancer. Um, this is just a diagram showing a normal cell versus a cancer cell is going to have more iron around for all the things it needs to do to grow. Um, I got all these papers here. So if somebody wants to read more on them, they're here. You can you can go look all this stuff up for yourself if you're interested. 
Um, Long-term phlebotomy is lowering the risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma. Yep. When they did the phlebotomies, they were able to decrease the risk by 4.5 fold. That's a big decrease in cancer risk. Okay. That's a giant decrease in cancer risk uh, by getting their iron levels down to lower the risk there for liver cancer. Hepatocellular is the same thing as liver cancer. Okay. Decreased cancer risk after iron reduction here. Um, there was no cancer when they were to keep the ferritins below 71 in this group. Here's this guy as a chart. Like I said, he He's a real nice guy too. He's got a couple of videos and he died, you know, recently, but he's got a couple of good YouTube videos talking about the benefit of getting your ferritin below uh, 80 in particular. And you don't have to have it that high, you know, 127 and you had higher cancer risk. So that's what I meant by, I used to think 200 was the reasonable threshold, but now I think, oh no, I want it below 100 and I'm working towards getting mine below 100. Okay. Uh, iron nutrition in mice. Yeah. More cancer, all bad stuff when you got more iron, free iron. Uh, here's Eugene Weiberg. He's another iron expert, wrote a good book on iron. And he's the guy who came up with that phrase. I love it, that iron is like a fire. It's good for you in the fireplace and the furnace and the stove, but it's bad everywhere else. Uh, meaning that you don't want any of it free. Okay. Uh, cancer is like an anaerobic bacteria. Another article. I'm, I'm just letting you know, there are tons and tons of paper on this. This is a giant subject. This has been researched extensively. As a matter of fact, there's papers on how bacteria get iron and how they they have this like chemical fight with the human body on how to get more iron. They build their own chemicals to steal iron. And then the body builds chemicals to prevent them from stealing iron. And that's been going back and forth. And guys have written papers on the counter. It reminds you of wrestling. Here's the counter. Here's the counter to the counter. Here's the counter to the counter, you know, to stop a move. And that's kind of the fight between the human body and bacteria. These are all ways the human body tries to hide iron away from bacteria. We talked about hepcidin shutting down absorption from the gut. We talked about ferritin storing it off. Uh, ceruloplasm is, is something to change the oxidative state of it. Lactoferrin, like in the milk, but also in the tear glands and stuff, will sequester iron so you don't get an infection in your eyes, for example, in your saliva. Uh, we sequester iron in there and, and in other proteins in the body. We put tons of effort to hiding iron away from bacteria. Um, and here's like a seesaw effect of these are things that cause increased risk of cancer, you know, being fat, having high stress with elevated cortisol, suppressing the immune system, because your immune system is what removes the cancer cells from your body. So you want your immune system to function well. And instead of being in the overnutrition, you know, fat phase, overnutrition, too much food, and especially too much animal protein and fat, et cetera, you want to be in the maintenance phase where you're exercising, you get your lymphatic uh, uh, flowing a lot better. So your white blood cells travel around the body faster to remove cancer cells. The high complex carbohydrate diet is the best one. Um, get your sleep, have all these things, a sense of purpose. For religion, some people help them, an attitude of gratitude, all that stuff. Uh, at least one good personal relationship in your life, hopefully more, but at least one. Uh, so this is a cancer prevention checklist. And sort of the big thing for today was just realizing this is doable for just about anybody getting their ferritin down. And that could potentially be very helpful. Um, all this other stuff I talked about before, you can read it if you're interested. There's a lot of things a person can do, but I think that's an important thing. Cause like when I, I see a lot of cancer patients, I've been involved in one way or the other with many, many thousands of cancer patients. Too many patients just think it's a doctor's job to try to help them. The smart person tries to help themselves. Yeah, see what the doctor can do. Maybe they can help you. That's great. But do what you can. There's a ton of things you can do. And it's based on understanding the metabolic theory of cancer to minimize cancer's access to the chemicals it needs to grow and to maximize the stuff to help prevent it from growing. All that stuff is doable. And you know, getting your sunshine, getting your sleep, having a positive attitude of gratitude, that sense of purpose. People with a sense of purpose, you know, they all just live longer and do better. Um, and helping others. And I think it's because it optimizes immune system function. It optimizes all these uh, systems in the body that keep us alive and keep our immune system, you know, removing cancer cells and protecting us. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to move into iron and the brain. How am I doing for time? You still have some time. I can even go up to another hour almost. If wow. You want. Okay. Cause I'm going to talk about something really cool. I'm going to talk about iron in the brain and I'm going to get into the work of Douglas Kella and Etheresia Pretoria. So that man and that woman uh, research team I showed you before, they did Nobel Prize work. It's beautiful and it's interesting and hardly anyone knows about it. Um, and it's going to help you understand a lot of other things about the brain. Okay, so total body iron storage. When you have high levels of serum ferritin, you got to also increase risk of dementia, which is not surprising <laughs> considering that it correlates with coronary artery disease and diabetes, okay? Um, and hypertension, everything bad. All right, substantia so nigra. You know, there's some association with that and excessive uh, bodily iron. Um, here's just a paper on that. And yeah, the same things that are going to help protect you from everything else helps lower your risk of Parkinson's. So just be aware of that. 
I'm not going to focus on that in particular. Oh, aluminum and iron will co-localize in the senile plaques, for example. And some people write a lot about that. Um, aluminum in the senile plaques, which is the ones associated with Alzheimer's, they promote ferrous, you know, iron redox cycling. Okay. Um, now, the guys who do research on aluminum, they're going to tell you like this guy, Exley, he's, his nickname is Mr. Aluminum. He's the most famous aluminum scientist in the world. He wrote a really good book about aluminum. And uh, he thinks aluminum is definitely the cause of Alzheimer's. Okay. And there's other people who are very bright who've read a lot about it and they think it's the main cause. And it definitely appears to contribute. But there's other major contributors to, to uh, dementia. And I've got a lot of experience studying dementia. And I can tell you, like here's Jack Del Torre. He was a guy who put forth the, um, the mouse equivalence theory of dementia. And he did awesome research on, on dementia. And he thinks that aluminum is not the main cause. So that's debatable. I think it contributes. This is obviously an academic turf issue. Everybody likes to think their research is the most important thing. So I think it's contributory. But just so you know, these heavy metals, they're bad for the brain. All of them are bad for the brain. So is aluminum, so is lead, et cetera. And excessive copper is bad for the brain too. All right, now we're going to get into something. Where I, we got to go through what I call the concept of amyloid proteins. So here's a normal protein. As a matter of fact, um, you know, like when you've got paper towel rolls and you could like look down through them and they're kind of round, it's hard to stack them up. I get a ball here. I got a ball right here. It'll, it'll make sense. Okay. So imagine your regular protein is like a ball, all right? It's hard to stack two balls on top of each other. They're just going to keep falling apart. That's what regular proteins are like. They don't want to stack up on each other. But imagine you took that same protein that was like rolled into a cylinder or a ball like this. Yeah, I'm looking at it like through a telescope and you flatten them out. Now you could stack lots of them. I could stack more and more and more. They're all flat and they're all stacking up on themselves. That's what happens. A big stack. Let's stack a couple more and we can stack more and we can stack more. We could go on into the thousands and keep stacking all this stuff up. That's what's happening with this process here of amyloidosis of a protein. So the normal protein here is coiled in what is called an alpha helix configuration. And that's going to be, again, cylindrical. You can look at you can look right through it there. And that rounded shape is very useful for a lot of things. But when it interacts with excessive iron causing oxidative stress, that can cause these internal hydrogen bonds between the parts of the same molecule. So that would be intra, intra means inside of, whereas these are inter, meaning between separate molecules. So here's one molecule, here's one molecule of the protein, and this is an inter, I-N-T-E-R, between them, sticking them together. So here's a normal shape maintained, but with oxidative stress from excessive free iron, reactive oxygen species, it'll distort it and it'll become flat, like stacking up like my hands, instead of being round and unstackable like these balls here, all right? So the danger of this is the bigger a molecule gets, the more likely it is to precipitate out of solution and become insoluble. In order for protein to function, it has to be soluble in solution, all right? So this is the normal functional protein, but when they interact with excessive free iron oxidative stress or they interact with LPS from the gram negative bacteria, I forgot to write LTA in here, lipotychoic acid from gram positive bacteria, it'll distort the shape of the protein. It'll flatten out and it'll start stacking up as it accumulates a big aggregate, a bigger stack. It'll precipitate out of solution. It'll have mass effect on other things. When this happens to fibrinogen, you're going to get excessive clotting. When it happens to beta amyloid in the brain, it can do damage to your brain cells. I'll explain why in just a moment. So when you eat food, the food passes through your, into your colon right here. And if you've got a leaky gut, some bacteria will get into your blood. A lot of those bacteria, initially they can't grow because they don't have any iron. So they're dormant. We all have dormant bacteria in our blood. That's not widely known. If you think about it for five minutes, it becomes pretty obvious. Everybody knows you can reactivate tuberculosis. Everybody knows you can reactivate syphilis. Everybody knows you can reactivate Lyme disease. Everybody knows you can reactivate genital herpes. You can reactivate oral herpes, okay? And there's a whole bunch of other less famous bacteria and viruses that can all be reactivated. They're hanging around dormant, okay? As a matter of fact, when a person... Um, gets a blood transfusion, they have increased risk of infection because they're going to get more free iron in the blood that can reactivate dormant bacteria. And so some other things that happen is if you got leaky gut, you're going to have more dormant bacteria in the blood. They found that if they just uh, took a blood transfusion and they put that on a culture 
they wouldn't get that much growth. But if they did it in, under anaerobic conditions, they got a lot more bacteria that grew. Um, also with leaky gut, you're going to get LPS. That's from the gram negative bacteria. That's the endotoxin lipopolysaccharide. That will also get into the blood in increased amounts. Lipopolysaccharide by itself, LPS, can interact with fibrinogen, the blood clotting, clotting protein, and cause it to transform from an alpha helix to a beta pleated sheet. So just remember, beta pleated sheet is being flat and it'll stack up, and the big stack's becoming insoluble. You know, this big stack of papers, the big mess, it becomes insoluble. And once it's insoluble, it can have mass effect on other things, and it can even push into other things and cause them to transform into an amyloid like beta pleated sheet configuration and subsequently aggregate and precipitate. So this is a major concept in health. So you, you want to know this. Uh, intramolecular uh, hydrogen bonds leading to the normal configuration, wild type configuration, and then damage to the protein either by free iron, LPS, or LTA, causing to form these inter between molecules, molecule number one, molecule number two, molecule number three, molecule number four, with hydrogen bonds between them as they stack up, all right? And so that's not good. It's going to cause abnormal blood clotting, uh, a, a bad form of blood clotting that's more resistant to lysis. Okay, so here's again Douglas Cowell. He's got videos online, and so does she, if you want to watch them, about the research on this. They got tons of paper on this subject. Um, you can also get these bacteria and LPS, LTA getting into your blood if you have leaky gums. So you want to take good care of your teeth, your mouth. You want to make sure you floss at night, you know, because at night you have less saliva production. You're more prone to getting calories. So clean those teeth before you go to bed. That's a big thing to do. Um, I like those little interdental brushes are real fast. Avoid sweets, avoid acidic things. Okay. I, by the way, whenever I look at demented brains, I can tell you on the vast majority of demented brains, I see, I always look at the eyes. Most of them had at least one cataract surgery. Then I look at the mouth. Most of them have terrible dentition, most, missing most of the teeth and not all of them. So what I'm trying to say is these things all go together. Poor dentition, uh, cataracts, and dementia. All right. I mean, cataracts is there's multiple different causation uh, mechanisms, but I'm, I'm just telling you, that's what I always see. I look at demented brains all the time. And I, uh, if I see a couple of cataracts and poor dentition, I can expect the guy's got poor cognitive function. Okay, I'll look in his chart. All right. Um, like I said, when there's free iron available, these bacteria in the blood can come out of their uh, dormancy, their hibernation, so to speak, and they can release LPS or LTA into the blood. And that can cause a prothrombotic milieu around them. And they can cause a lot of clotting, surprisingly, how bad it is. If they simultaneously, the person has areas of blood-brain barrier breakdown, increased permeability, this can then have an effect on the brain, including be related to precipitation of beta amyloid in the brain. And that was kind of the big theory of uh, Douglas Kellen and, and Pretorius, that these leaky gut or leaky gums leading to bacteria and LPS and LTA in the blood was causing precipitation of beta amyloid and causing dementia, Alzheimer's type mechanism. So they're, they use that as their explanation for Alzheimer's. But like I said, it's causing clotting all over the place, which can increase your risk of myocardial infarction and stroke. Um, so here's one paper about translocation of bacteria and their lipopolysaccharides between the blood and the peripheral locations, um, the dormant bacteria being reactivated. By the way, some of their papers are like some of the most cited papers you'll ever see. There's lots of researchers fascinated and interested in their work. Um, Okay, like I said, everybody knows about these common bacteria and their dormant phases, and less people are aware. It seems that the bacteria have the ability, and some of the viruses almost sense when the immune system is weak. Maybe the cortisol is high, for example. Some other bacteria can do weird things, like even live inside of a white blood cell or a red blood cell. That's getting into some esoteric stuff. We don't need to get into that. Uh, but I'm just letting you know, dormant bacteria, you know, they've seen it in Micrococcus luteus and a whole bunch of other ones. Um, and like I said, they're sort of sitting around waiting for some iron to become available. Uh, Propiobacterium acne was another real common one. Okay, so LPS, you know, from the gram negative bacteria, it inter interacts with something called toll like receptor 4, LTA with toll like receptor 2, but LTA is really just about bad, as bad or worse as LPS. People didn't know as much about LTA because it hadn't been studied as extensively. I'll show, I'm going to show you a really great paper that uh, by those guys. Um, and they, they refer, the terms they use is iron dysregulation, and they call it the iron dysregulation and dormant microbe hypothesis, okay, of Callan Pretorius. Um, inflammation itself is prothrombotic. You know, when you have inflammation, the liver releases what are called acute phase reactants, like to deal with any inflammation or infection in the body. And that includes clotting proteins, fibrinogen, factor eight, von Willenbrand factor. Also, when you're stressed out, being stressed out 
is sensed by the body as like an acute phase reactant uh, mode, and it'll release this stuff in there. That's why stress is makes the blood a little bit more prothrombotic. Um, and of course, LPS and LTA make the blood more prothrombotic. Okay, so iron dysregulation, another paper by these guys in dormant microbes, uh, causative agents for impaired blood rheology, making the blood thicker, more prone to clotting in Alzheimer's dementia. Okay, so they show the leaky gut, compromised gut barriers, getting bacteria and LPS into the blood. They call it atopal. They really just sort of mean ectopic, bacteria in the wrong location. You don't want bacteria in your blood. And they'll show them you know, with their uh, scanning electron micrographs, for example, here's a bacteria in the blood. It doesn't belong there. Abnormal platelet here. It's sort of a, a blebbed platelet. They're not supposed to look like that. And you'll also show them. I'll show them later with different types of clots around. It. Okay. Again, we talked about ferrous redox cycling because this is where all that, those reactive oxygens are generated, especially hydroxyl radical. Okay. We talked about in the mitochondria, the Fenton reaction from the ion. I know you've already seen those slides before, but just a reminder, and that can then lead to lipid peroxidation, destroying these membranes in a form of what is called ferroptosis, destroying membranes here in the plasma membrane. Okay. We, we, we just went through this amyloidosis uh, transformation of other of proteins, including fibrinogen. That's the one you got to know. Fibrinogen, the blood clotting uh, protein being transformed into an amyloid-like configuration, flattened, stackable, beta-pleated sheet configuration. So here's another paper by Callan Pretorius, you know, another example from their paper showing that normal red blood cell, how it's supposed to look, relatively clear surface. But when you get um, a high serum ferritin, you start getting more and more of these distorted cells, spikes on there. So it's like an acanthocyte. It's a teardrop shape. That's all bad. And instead of having uh, normal spaghetti-like um, fibrinogen, the clots become more matted and irregular. And you start accumulating debris on the surface of the red blood cell. So all of this is prothrombotic. And these are some of the things that are happening in the context of dementia. Um, I think dementia, I think this is the way I see it, just so you know, is I see this as contributing to the vascular risk factors. And I like the vascular metabolic de deletory approach to dementia. Um, I also have something I call the Rogers uh, uncoupling theory of dementia. They all contribute. They all happen simultaneously. Um, here's a better example of the clot picture. So here's a normal fibrin clot looking like pieces of spaghetti relative to each other. And here it is, the abnormal clots in the presence of LPS, LTA, and excessive uh, free iron and reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress. It becomes more matted and irregular. And the point being is the body will sometimes form a clot and then need to dissolve it. It's a lot harder for the body to dissolve these clots. So they're more likely to progress to uh, tissue injury, tissue hypoxia. Okay, here's just another paper by Pretorius, Cal, and some of their lab uh, partners that the LPS becomes autocatalytic, and you get these amyloid-like blood clots, meaning the stackable, insoluble proteins. And here was an amazing thing about it. They found the ratio of molecules of LPS to fibrinogen was increased. You, you amplify the cascade by a factor of 10 to the 8th. That's an incredible number. They said it is unparalleled in biology. What they're saying is this LPS, LTA, and excessive free iron oxidative stress can be very, very thrombogenic, okay? So here's another diagram from the article. Increased presence of LPS in the blood. LPS binds to plasma proteins like fibrinogen. LPS bound fibrinogen clots abnormality because it's transformed into an amyloid-like protein, meaning going from a alpha helix cylindrical configuration to a primarily beta pleated sheet flattened configuration where it can stack and the hydrogen bonds form in between separate molecules rather than being inside the same molecule. Um, and that starts causing clots in different locations where you don't want. All right, now here's a cool paper where, you know, where they sort of prove this uh, additionally is for LPS and LTA and for iron. It's a rather amazing paper here. And I, to me, this is like the, like the grand finale. You know, you see the fireworks at the 4th of July. Look how magnificent this paper. This is like Nobel Prize work here. Normal control, you don't see this. By the way, Congo red is a stain that binds heavily to any protein in an amyloid configuration. And so what they showed was when you add, you know, uh, platelet-free, pla platelet-poor plasma or just blood thrombin and fibrinogen, you add a little LPS, you get this dramatic increase in clotting. You add a little extra iron and you get oxidative stress, dramatic increase in clotting of these amyloid forms of the protein. Same thing with LTA from the gram-negative bacteria. So it should normally be colorless. And here it's like the 4th of July, all these colors are lighting up because you're staining amyloid through the roof. And I just joked, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And this is rather incredible. I mean, to go from one molecule to 10 to the eighth fibrinogens clotting, that's an extraordinary amount of amplification. So 
I'm just letting you know, it's a pretty powerful effect. And that's a pretty amazing way they showed all this stuff. And there's other things that can happen. These aggregates, you imagine these are the stackable proteins. They drew them this way. This is how they drew them. But they can in, sort of intercalate with the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane of a neuron, let's say in the hippocampus. And they can have a mass effect upon the NMDA receptor uh, for glutamate. That is the most important neurotransmitter in the brain. It's about 80% of brain neurotransmitters, in particular in the hippocampal memory center. Glutamate will bind this. It'll open this up. And so you can open up these ion channels. And what they're saying is, the mechanical size of the enlarging uh, beta amyloid protein aggregate can activate this NMDA receptor when it shouldn't be activated. And that can lead to excitotoxicity, killing the um, hippocampal neurons, glutaminergic receptors, the NMDA glutaminergic receptor. So that's a rather fascinating way. And this also explains, people used to think, oh, you can't do anything with a protein because the protein is dead by itself. How could it propagate itself? How could it cause all these effects? Well, here's how it could do it. Through, through mass effect, it can propagate and damage uh, individual cells and adjacent cells. So that's the beta amyloid mechanism. And then here is sort of um, Douglas Cowell and Atheresia Pretoris' sort of summary slide. Basically, leaky gut or leaky gums, getting atopobiosis, meaning dormant bacteria in the blood. These dormant bacteria in the blood are activated by iron becoming more available, free iron. And that microbial reaction is causing them to release LPS and LTA, which then leads to a prothrombotic phase in the blood with an amyloid type fibrinogen configuration, damaging cells, clotting off their oxygen supplies. And in the context of blood brain barrier permeability, which is often present in some location, like normally in the circumventricular origins, uh, low organs around the third ventricle, but also when there's damage to the blood brain barrier from hypertension, from diabetes and whatnot, from strokes, from head trauma and whatnot. Um, you can then get uh, some of this entering into the brain and having prothrombotic effects in the brain and amyloidogenic effects on the beta amyloid protein around the outside surface of neurons. So it's a rather extraordinary thing and um, sort of fascinating. So anyways, I thought that was pretty cool. So what does this all mean? What it all means is it's a good idea to keep your iron low. Okay, that's sort of like the take home message. Um, you want to avoid things that cause leaky gut because it's leaky gut contributes. So all that stuff we talked about in a recent lecture on autoimmune disease is relevant to this. Everything we talked about autoimmune disease is relevant, not just leaky gut, but the other stuff and things that cause tissue hypoxia. So I thought that was rather fascinating. The whole way that iron is not just a problem for growing cells. It's also a problem for reactivation of dormant bacteria. And in a sense, suppressing your immune system. You don't want to do that. And it's pretty easy to lower. Avoid all the foods with iron in them and consider donating blood. And if you don't want to donate a, a whole unit, donate a half unit. If you don't want to donate a half unit, um, donate just a couple of tubes. Every time you go for blood draw, just draw off an extra tube or two or three or four. And um, this is very doable. So anyways, I thought that was pretty interesting. Oh, I said, here's all the languages you have learned. Carbohydrates, fats, proteins, antioxidants, fiber, ions, mitochondrial dysfunction, and on and on and on. It's like learning to speak in tongues. So now at Pentecost, you can speak in tongues. Go out and teach other people. Uh, in the name of the starch, the fruit, and the vegetable, teach them to observe all things I have shared with you. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. So anyway, that's Matthew 28. I thought that was kind of entertaining. So hope that helps. Good luck to you. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Would it be okay to ask you a few questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, do you want to just uh, take your slides off and we can look at yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can do that. If not, I can help you do that. Stop sharing. There we go. So I'm curious why this topic, what got you interested in exploring iron so deeply? Well, it sort of seemed to me one thing that was standing out uniquely that was doable. You know what I mean? You go on the whole plant-based route and you can optimize a whole bunch of things. And you don't have to really think about it. But Look at me, I'm a perfect example. I had done everything as good as I could do it with the diet, but my iron level is still high because you don't reverse things as fast with iron as you do with other things. You know, like you listen to Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, he'll tell you, you're going to get improved blood flow, you know, just two days later and dramatically so within a week, you'll start making more nitric oxide in your endothelial cells and they're still coming back to life, if you will. But the iron, you can't, you can't change that because your body cannot excrete it. You can only excrete, you know, a milligram or two a day. So you, um, You've got to do something on your own to make an effort. It's not going to fix itself as easy as other stuff is going to fix it. And you're putting yourself at risk for a lot of problems. So I actually, like I said, I donated some blood and then I, I, I have a couple extra tubes pulled off when I go for blood labs. And um, I also, uh, 
I'm real careful about avoiding foods. And a lot of people aren't aware of those grains having the iron added to them. So, and I have an iron filter on my water to remove it from my water, drinking water and shower water and all that. What kind of water filter do you use? Well, first of all, I got water from a well. And the reason is because well water is the best. Everybody thinks, oh, I want city water. I want city water. Well, why do you want city water? Okay. Because the, the city water, a lot of times is F minus, it's got aluminum in it, things you don't want. If you, you got to test the well water first, you don't want to have your well right next to a place where they're doing fracking or who knows what, but check the well water first in that community. And then I think a well is better to have. Um, and then I have a reverse osmosis filter for in the kitchen. So that's sort of the optimal filtration. Distillation is maybe a little better, but distillation is a little more complicated. But then for the whole house, I'll have a carbon filter for the whole house. And I'll also have an iron filter. Okay. So, cause you know, iron will stain things. It'll stain like your bathroom floor and other things. Um, so those are the reasons for doing that. So a lot of people worry about the opposite problem of having low iron. Well, I think that's especially the case, like when a girl first becomes, hits puberty, because she starts menstruating, losing iron, and she's in a rapid growth phase. So she's got a real higher iron demand. But all these authors, they felt that most of these young women who are iron uh, deficient, they felt they felt it's being diagnosed too much. They think that the, the cutoff for iron deficiency, they feel, is that it's it's set too high, if you will. And they think lots of women are being overtreated with iron that don't really need it. They're asymptomatic, they're healthy, and they think that the threshold should be set lower. So that'd be something, you know, to work out with the hematologist or the internist, whoever's the person for that patient. But just be aware, they claim these multiple different iron experts that a lot of women are getting started on iron supplements at a young age, and they keep taking them sometimes for life, and they're just making themselves iron overloaded, and it's a mistake. It's bad for their health. Well, you know, I took some, by the way, your lectures are so comprehensive and I think they're above my pay grade. I'm curious, do you ever lecture at medical school, schools or to physicians? Oh, I do all the time. I, I, I'm, it's very common. I have a lot of internal medicine friends. They come to me for management of a lot of problems you would consider internal medicine problems. And cause I had the experience, you know, my kids got a little older. I would sit around reading and, you know, I was pretty good at biochemistry, not to brag, but I was like about just about the best biochemistry student in the entire United States when I was in medical school. I think I got a 780 out of 800 and I think 99% they'll start somewhere in the 600s. So anyways, the reason I say that is I always found biochemistry fascinating. Okay. I, I, I loved it. It was my favorite subject when I was younger. I was actually going to become a biochemist, but then I, then I also, I didn't like organic synthetic lab. Everything smelled like paint. So I decided not to do that. Um, but getting back to it is I started to read outside of the books. I would ask myself a simple question, what causes diabetes? And then I would sit there and I'd start reading all the papers and try to figure everything out and make all the connections. And I kept realizing all of these things I was discovering from reading the papers, they're not in the standard literature. And then I would do the same thing. What causes atherosclerosis? Uh, what causes hypertension? What causes dementia? And I sort of discovered all of this stuff. It's not in any of the standard textbooks. Literally, the big you know, 2,000 page Harvard textbooks of pathology, 2,000 page textbooks of neurology, it's not there. And I'm like, wow. And I kind of like this because people sometimes say to me, you know, why do you spend so much time reading a book? My wife will say to me, why do you waste all your time? Life isn't in a book. Why don't you go out and moonlight, make some money for this family? And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I work enough. I'm tired after working five days a week. I don't want to work six or seven days a week uh, with that type of work. So, and I also was, I was happy. I'm like, holy crap. I'm I'm like, in a sense, discovering the knowledge that's out there, you know, and, and no one else is knowing this because I talk to other doctors all the time. They don't know all this stuff. Um, and this is very valuable knowledge. So that's why I enjoy it. And I'm fascinated by it because, and you think about it, look at Watson and Crick who discovered the structure of DNA. They just did that from studying the work of all the other PhDs. The PhDs, in my experience, they can't put it all together. I have a really unique background, you know, surgical experience, biochemistry experience, radiology experience, clinical experience. So I, I, I have a knack for it and I enjoy the reading and I'm quite happy to concentrate for prolonged amounts of time to figure out how everything's connected. And you, you start seeing basically Plant food's good, animal food's bad. <laughs> high fat, well, there's high fat. We that, I don't want to get into all the details of that, but I, you, you see where I'm going with this. And also toxicology. Basically, nutrition and toxicology are not talked to, to physicians. They don't know anything about it. It's this giant gap in their knowledge. And it's a big deal because at least 70% of disease is caused by diet problems and toxicology. Wow. You know, when people are iron deficient, a lot of times they'll supplement on their own. And wouldn't it be important to find out the cause first? Yes. Yes, of course. If, if, if you're, let's say you have a middle-aged person, you know, you worry, are they bleeding from their colon? They could have a colon cancer. They might need a colonoscopy. Um, a lot of women, they've got like fibroids of their uterus, for example, and they could have excessive menstruation, menstrual bleeding from that. Um, so you would want to know what's causing it. Um, but in a meat eating population and in a population where the grains and the cereals are fortified, 
the there's far more people are iron overloaded than iron deficient, but most people aren't aware of iron overload as a concept even. And you want to check that serum ferritin to get an idea on it. One of the things you said that I found uh, alarming was that iron is a tumor promoter. Oh, yes. Yeah. This guy, Jim Moon, I don't know if I got his book. Yeah, I got his book right here. Right here. And he's a smart guy. Let's see if I can get it to, to focus. Right. It's not focusing. you got to hold it back because you're using a virtual screen. Oh, there we go. Iron. Okay. And basically he says it's the worst carcinogen in the world. I, I think that's an exaggeration because, you know, the guy spends his life researching iron. He, he sees everything related to iron, but it's still um, a, a significant carcinogen. And there were pretty dramatic rates, especially in liver cancer, but it's relevant everywhere because it, it's doing all the things. And like the way I think of stuff is, I know the thing's not sensing me as well did before. Basically, Look at Napoleon. When Napoleon went into Russia, you know, when was that? In about two, uh, 1812, okay? The Russians did a scorch earth policy. They said, you will not get any food. Because, you know, Napoleon used to all say, an army munches, marches on his stomach, okay? And so he'd always take all the food locally. And the Russians said, you know, we're not going to give you anything, okay? They would burn the crops, all right? So the point being is, I think in a sense, that's a good strategy for cancer patients. Say to their cancer, you know what, pal? I am not going to give you any iron. I am not going to give you any extra leucine. I'm not going to give you any. I'm going to methionine restrict. I'm going to leucine restrict. I'm going to iron restrict. I'm going to restrict fats. You're going to get nothing. Okay. That's it. And so I think that's a good approach. I'm also going to keep things alkaline. I'm going to not be adding sodium to get that low grade metabolic acidosis from the excessive chloride. So I think all of those ways, you slow the thing down. You slow it down 50%. You live twice as long. You know, slow it down more than that. You live even longer. And there's a lot of people who've had extraordinary survivals. And so that's what I would suggest would be something to aim for. You know, it's interesting because so many people are worried about not having enough iron. And, and this is might be the first time they're hearing that having too much is also a problem. Yep. That's what I thought. I was, I was, I was ignorant of that when I was younger and I used to eat all the, I picked raisin bran cereal, especially when I was, you know, in my teens and twenties, because I wanted to be iron. I wanted to be strong. I wanted to be a wrestler. You know, I didn't realize that I was, I was overloading myself with iron. Uh, do, do grapes have as much iron as raisins? Should we be worried? I don't know how much, but I would be careful with them. Red wine in particular tends to be a little higher in iron. Um, and so I would expect that grapes probably would be a little high in iron. I'm not a big fan of grapes too, because I figure they probably spray them with herbicides and pesticides. And how are you gonna how are you gonna wash a grape? You know, the skin is so fragile. Yeah. What foods are highest in iron, the ones that have not been fortified with extra iron? Well, of course, the meats, you know, like red meat in particular tends to be pretty high in iron. Um and we kind of talked about like the red meat is the slow twitch fibers because it's got more myoglobin in there. So red meat's going to be higher in iron. Um, so I would avoid that sort of stuff. Um, a lot of plants kind of protect you. They'll have things in them like phytates, for example, that sort of bind the iron, like in the wheat brands and whatnot. So if the wheat brand did not have iron added to it, it would actually be pretty good. It's just the tendency to fortify stuff that makes it bad. That's interesting. You mentioned cast iron cookware. Some people are still cooking with it. They should Bad idea. I would never do that. Never. I was surprised because the Bantu population, they had iron levels off the charts and they were, they were cooking their food and they're, and they're making special beverages. They would, they would heat in it and they got a lot of iron ingestion by that way. Yeah, that that's really interesting. So, um, I have a couple of questions that were sent in for you that aren't about iron, but would it be okay to ask them just because people wrote them sure, in specifically sure. for you? Thank you. So this first one is from Helen. And she said, could you please ask Dr. Rogers if he knows much about sarcoidosis and its causes and ability to recover? Here in the UK, the doctors just tell me they can only offer immune suppressants and steroids. Yeah, you know what? I don't know that much about sarcoid. I'm not even sure exactly how to categorize it. Um, maybe it's an autoimmune disease, but I don't know for sure. I would just sort of say in general, it's kind of a little bit of a, like a joke, like what Dr. McDougall says. If somebody told me that at earwax, I would recommend the low-fat plant-based diet. Okay. And so what I'm saying is I don't know the pathophysiology of sarcoid that well, but the same things that tend to be healthy, they tend to be healthy for everything because they're optimizing cellular function, they're optimizing tissue oxygenation, they're optimizing arterial vasodilation. So for all those reasons, I would think that those things will probably help you. But you know, I don't know sarcoid. Okay, what what is that by the way? Sarcoid is like this progressive disease, typically starts in the lungs, a lot of lymphadenopathy, let's say in the mediastinum, and then it gradually 
you, you'll get nodules in the lung, you'll progress to pulmonary fibrosis, and that's your typical sarcoid is pulmonary sarcoidosis. But it can sometimes occur in the brain. You can get a neurosarcoidosis. That's really rare, though. Pulmonary sarcoid is more common. Thank you. Uh, Jane says, Dr. Rogers, you recommended that we avoid tea due to its fluoride content. Green tea is recognized as having strong anti-cancer effects. Is it possible that the anti-carcinogenic effect of green tea outweighs the harm caused by fluoride in any caffeine from the tea? Um, so I don't know the answer to that precisely, uh, but I can just tell you in general, my experience with the so-called profitable commercial superfoods is that they're all overrated because it doesn't just concentrate F minus. It also has a tendency to concentrate aluminum, uh, potentially other things and the caffeine I don't think is good. So I'm not a big fan of all that stuff. Plus any food that's profitable, it's got typically, you know, millions of dollars of marketing behind it. Okay. I have family members who drink tea and I tell them, I think it's stupid. And they're all like, oh, well, we saw, you know, something on the internet and, and I'm like, okay, go ahead. Believe some, somebody on the internet trying to sell you something versus believe me, you know, I love you and I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay. So I said, I think you're being an idiot. They don't listen to me sometimes. <laughs> you're funny. I like you. You're, you're cracking me up. Well, you really do spend a lot of time researching this and, and, and for you, it's fun, isn't it? Oh yeah, I enjoy it. I actually think that um, to some extent, I really should be doing this. I really wish I could be like in a research foundation. They should pay people like me who really want to do this. You know, uh, I'm very happy reading research papers all day. I enjoy it because I feel like I'm seeing deeper into it, almost like as better as well as anyone in the whole world or better. And so I, I wish I could do it more often. You know, I work five days a week, clinical work, and I would love to, you know, be able to do this more often because I could figure out all kinds of things. I see all kinds of connections that I'm, I'm like trying to understand between uh, insulin, mechanisms of insulin resistance, causes of hypertension, dementia. And I find it fascinating to go around those papers. I just wish I had more time to do it. Well, Dr. Greger made a, made a, made a, you know, made a career out of, you know, reading all the research papers. So. Yeah. He, I wish I had his skill I, I and his marketing skill and all that, you know, he knows how to make it into business. I'm just kind of a nerdy scholar. I don't have good marketing skills or networking skills. It takes a lot to have a good business. And that's sort of like, I got the scholarship part, but I don't got the other parts. Okay. Well, if anybody out there can help Dr. Rogers, let us know. Thank you so much, Dr. Rogers. Thanks. This was very, very wonderful. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow. Let's see who is the guest. Hmm, I should know this, shouldn't I? It's, let's see, May 15th. Okay. I, I got to have this stuff written down so I can tell you that will be the third Monday of the month. So, oh, it's Dr. Sunil Pai. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.